conference of uh, secretary of the table in the European Union. Uh, and when we speak about secretary of the table, uh, usually is dividing, uh, questioning uh, how many hours do you sit per day? So, for example, in this study, the definition of uh, sedentary behavior was uh, sitting more than 4.5 hours per day. And uh, Lopez, Valenciano, and colleagues showed that uh, the percentage of uh, sedentary behavior increased by 4% during uh, a period of uh, 15 uh, years. And uh, uh, we, we have reasons to believe that this trend continues to increase. Let's see some other trends about uh, running performance and participation in marathon runs. Uh, allow me to provide some historical uh, perspective about the, marathon, the history of marathon. Uh, its origin uh, was uh, uh, in the antiquity. There was uh, a battle of marathon 2,500 years ago in a place about 40 kilometers from Athens. And uh, when the battle was finished, uh, Philippides, uh, a soldier, ran uh, this distance from Marathon to Athens to announce uh, the victory. Uh, many years passed from that period till uh, the first uh, modern Olympics in 1896, and uh, where uh, but, uh, such a race uh, would offer prestige in this uh, new type of uh, competition of uh, games. In the same period, uh, in uh, Boston, in the uh, USA, uh, the first marathon race uh, was uh, performed also there. Of course, we should wait about one century, almost till uh, Los Angeles uh, 1984 Olympic Games to see the participation of women in uh, Olympic Games in this sport. Uh, we are interested uh, with uh, our uh, research group uh, studying uh, trends in participation uh, in uh, endurance races uh, because we try to see if uh, the participation increases, uh, uh, who participates more, uh, what about uh, the role of sex, age, nationality. So we focus on uh, very big uh, race events like uh, New York City Marathon, Boston Marathon, Berlin Marathon, uh, because uh, uh, many thousands of uh, runners participate there and uh, make it uh, possible to have some uh, uh, analysis of uh, practical events. So if you, we study the history of marathon during the recent years, we observe a large uh, increase of participation, and uh, this participation uh, is uh, impressive uh, for uh, women and master uh, age groups, uh, that is uh, age groups older than 50 years old. Of course, uh, all age group and both sexes increase the participation in uh, marathon races. For example, if we observe the trends of finishers in the New York City marathon, uh, we will see that uh, both men the upper line and women increase participation. But if we look uh, more carefully the men to women ratio, we will 
see that uh, uh, this ratio decreases across years. That means that compared to, to men, more women uh, participate in marathon races. And this makes it uh, more interesting because uh, a, a new field in forums uh, to provide uh, sex-specific uh, information because of the new engagement of women in this sport. So, from the other, one side, we observe that uh, there is an increase of uh, sedentarism. On the other side, we observe that there is an increase in participation in marathon races, and uh, we assume that uh, there is an increase also in uh, uh, physical activity, in leisure time physical activity. So, the main question is, are these uh, marathon runners both uh, physically active and sedentary, and if yes, uh, how the sedentarism relates with the physical fitness. It is uh, interesting to see in a recent uh, study uh, on uh, sitting uh, behavior in uh, marathon and half marathon runners that. Uh, they spent about uh, 8 to 11 hours uh, on uh, average uh, in sitting. Uh, these uh, authors observed that there was no association of uh, sedentarism with uh, training characteristics. Uh, however, they didn't provide uh, any data about uh, physical fitness. So we are interested to see how the physical fitness relates with uh, sedentarism. And when we speak about uh, physical uh, fitness, several uh, definitions uh, exist. Uh, but uh, the most interesting uh, is that uh, uh, one who is uh, in good uh, shape, in good uh, physical fitness, will be able to perform uh, successfully uh, the duties of uh, daily life. So we are interested especially in health-related fitness. And uh, in this uh, uh, presentation here, we present the parameters of uh, physical fitness, aerobic capacity, body composition, mass strength, mass endurance, and flexibility. In the present study, we will uh, focus on uh, aerobic capacity and body composition and uh, mass strength because in these parameters, we see in some uh, relationship with uh, performance. So, the aim of uh, this study was to uh, examine if this physical fitness differ in others based on uh, the level of uh, sedentarism. If uh, these runners of a different uh, sedentarism uh, I hope you are able to follow my presentation. Uh, if uh, body mass index and body pattern differ uh, based on sedentarism, or the training, uh, when we say training, we mean uh, the cover kilometers per week uh, differ by the level of uh, sedentarism. For the purpose of this study, we used uh, data from uh, our project on marathon runners in Athens, 19. Uh, uh, 2017. We consider data on 151 uh, finishers, uh, 122 men, 29 women. The average age was 43 years old. So we made uh, a series of uh, exercise testing. Uh, we focused on build mass, uh, muscle strength, uh, body mass index, uh, body fat percentage, and we record some basic training characteristics, focusing on uh, the weekly uh, covered uh, kilometers. For uh, assessing.
sitting uh, sedentarism, we used uh, the multi-context uh, sitting uh, time questionnaire. It is a questionnaire uh, that uh, was uh, constructed uh, about uh, a decade ago. First, it asks uh, the participant uh, about his work, how many hours work uh, per week, and uh, which days uh, works per week. Then, uh, we evaluate uh, for both working days in the upper table and non-working days in the lower table, sitting time in various uh, situations. For example, uh, we calculate time of sleeping. This is not the sitting time. And then sitting while working, while watching TV, in front of a computer video games, uh, sitting when we uh, commute uh, using transportation to go and work, or uh, sitting during uh, using social uh, media. So this is uh, our questionnaire about sedentary behavior. And when we sum all these uh, parameters, except sleeping, then we have the overall uh, sitting uh, time per day. So about statistics, we use descriptive, descriptive uh, statistics uh, to provide mixed and standard deviations and also uh, personal to examine the correlation among uh, parameters and tests to compare uh, groups with different uh, level of uh, sedentarism. So let's see the results. First of all, if we compare the sitting behavior between women and men, we found no difference. For example, the overall sitting behavior in women in the working days was 9.6 hours, in men was 9.7 hours. And uh, on average, during uh, the week, women spend 8.8 .8, uh, hours per, per day in uh, sedentarism, while men spend 8.9 uh, hours per day in the city. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we can uh, see some uh, small trends uh, when we see the different uh, tasks, but there was not a significant difference. For example, about sitting and working, women was 4.8, whereas men was 5.2, but there was no significant, uh, significant difference. Uh, in, uh, in the social media, women 1.1, men 0.7. So let's see uh, some trends in uh, sedentarism uh, among uh, the days. If we compare the working and uh, non-working days, uh, we observe some differences. Because, uh, for example, when uh, there's a working day, of course, people uh, spend more time in sitting uh, in their work and uh, less time watching TV, playing video games uh, or social media, but also uh, more time in uh, sitting during transportation because uh, obviously they should travel uh, to go to their work and uh, come back. If we examine the total uh, of uh, sitting uh, behavior, we see that uh, there is a higher value in uh, the working day than in uh, the non-working day. So we have an average about nine hours per day, and this is close to seven in the non-working days and close to 10 during the working days. So now let's uh, see the interesting uh, findings of uh, our study. 
If we examine the correlation of uh, sedentary time with the physical fitness, we see close to zero uh, the correlation with uh, body mass index, so it is trivial. Because independent of uh, sedentary time, even if participant uh, sits uh, for a while or spend uh, the majority of uh, hours sitting, uh, no trend in body mass index was uh, observed. Uh, the same was also uh, true for uh, body fat percentage. The correlation was negative 0.05, no significant, it was trivial. When we examine the correlation between PO2 mass with uh, sedentary time, again we observe no correlation, value close to zero, it, the result uh, was uh, trivial, so uh, even those who had a high score in VO2 max or low score in VO2 max uh, didn't uh, show uh, some trend of increase or decrease. And also a uh, similar trend was uh, shown when we examine the relationship of uh, isometric uh, muscle strength, which included four uh, measures of uh, muscle strength, right and uh, left uh, hand grip uh, strength, trunk and uh, trunk and legs uh, uh, performance. And uh, lastly, uh, no correlation was observed between running distance, kilometers per week, and sedentary time. Of course, we should uh, note that here the relationship the R was close to 0.08, of, again it was trivial. Then we compared the uh, uh, marathon runners uh, with low sedentary time, low, uh, less than uh, about nine hours per day, and high sedentary time, uh, that is with more than nine hours per day. No difference was observed in, in, uh, in their body mass index. For example, both of them, uh, they had uh, 24.2 units. Uh, body fat was 18.4 uh, uh, versus 17.8. VO2 mass about 46. Uh, muscle strength was about 4.85 in both groups and the uh, weekly kilometers was 53 and 51 kilometers. Uh, no difference in any of these parameters was observed between low and high sedentary participants. So let's put uh, these interesting uh, findings uh, together. We observed uh, no difference in, uh, no sex difference in uh, sitting uh, behavior. There were some differences in uh, working and uh, non-working days. We see, for example, sitting in work and uh, transport, sitting in transportation was higher in working days, whereas watching TV, uh, playing video games or socializing was more in the non-working days. But we found no correlation of uh, sitting time with physical fitness, which was in agreement with the no difference between low and high sedentary and marathon animals. Uh, if we examine uh, our findings in the light of uh, previous findings, uh, a very interesting uh, trend uh, is uh, shown. A meta-analysis of uh, relevant studies uh, selected uh, 21 papers corresponding to about 11,000 participants. Uh, we speak about general population, not athletes. 
and uh, they conclude that there is a significant uh, relationship, inverse relationship between the total sedentary time and aerobic capacity and the muscle strength. That is, these authors, Silva and colleagues, observe that the higher the score of sedentary time, the lower was the aerobic capacity and muscle strength. And the findings were very important because we know that cardio respiratory uh, fitness and muscle strength are important health related fitness parameters because one who has low cardio respiratory fitness, low muscle strength has for example increased the risk for mortality. So uh, the previous studies so the negative relationship, we observe non-relationship. Uh, and uh, doctor, one So to conclude, uh, exactly in uh, time, uh, our findings, uh, we have no, uh, we have no significant uh, correlation. So that these our findings are negative, but also the negative findings when study does not show significant relationships. Also it is important because it seems that uh, we found that uh, no difference in uh, marathon runners based on the sedentaries, which shows that uh, when somebody makes uh, regular endurance training, may counterbalance the negative uh, effects of uh, synthetizers. And this is a very important uh, message to take uh, home. So thank you very much uh, for uh, your attention. I provide my mail here. I will be happy to answer the questions now or if somebody else wants to write some email. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for uh, this uh, interesting uh, talk and uh, take home message. So uh, we have uh, five minutes for the audience if, uh, if there is any question. So uh, uh, to recapitulate, so uh, finally the sedentary time has no relationship with uh, fitness, that's what uh, we need to know. So maybe it will depend on other factors. We can have more sedentary time, but we can have small time to exercise. That's true. Okay, so uh, is there any question from uh, here, from uh, the audience? Uh, uh, I, I would have uh, one question, please. So now uh, your study was based on uh, a sample from your uh, from Greece, okay? So if we want to have uh, external validity and to, we can generalize the the results, uh, can we compare the same uh, pattern of uh, sedentary activity in uh, other countries, maybe? Uh, in uh, Tunisia, or in America, or in Europe, do you think we have the same definition of uh, sedentary time? Thank you for, uh, very much for uh, the question. Uh, looking at uh, the literature, uh, we, we observe a very large uh, 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 variation of the definitions about uh, sedentarism. Yeah. Uh, however, uh, the common point is that uh, sedentary time is when somebody is uh, sitting uh, alone. So this is a big problem in uh, uh, nowadays, I think uh, everywhere, because I guess that uh, even there you work uh, too much uh, in the Computer, uh, the guys also from Tunisia, I see you are very active in conducting the research, uh, writing the paper, so I imagine you are sitting a lot also uh, in front of uh, PC. Uh, so the, negative, the, the positive message is that 
even if you somebody is sitting many hours per day, if he is engaged in regular exercise like the marathon, like not uh, athletes, but like the recreational marathoners who have about 40 to 50 kilometers running distance per week. So uh, this would counterbalance uh, the negative effects of uh, sedentarism. Thank you uh, again very much for your uh, talk and uh, another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Major are 
uh, well known in Fiji here as the most effective measure to curb the spread of disease. The weakening of social contact can potentially result in mistaking the laws of Asia what with our interruption of normal life, study, and can generate stress from the population. So in order to improve our understanding of the mental health consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, our CFP COVID-19 consortium was among the first to launch a multiple language and multiple animal survey to assess the effect of Hong Kong in on psychosocial health status and multiple lifestyle behavior during the COVID-19 outbreak. Two main objectives were behind this work. At first, to provide an insight into the effect of Hong Kong on mental well-being, depression, life satisfaction, and multiple national lifestyle behavior, such as physical and social activity, type of behavior, sleep quality, and economic use. And then we can divide the possible relationship between psychosocial and behavioral change here in the Hong Kong Kingdom, and also to identify the main predictor of psychosocial strain here in Hong Kong Kingdom. So we can then recommend some uh, strategy to mitigate this psychosocial strain. We emphasize that social distancing will negatively affect mental and emotional well-being via increasing sedentary activities, social exclusion, increasing sleep quality, and lower proportion of uh, consumption of health in that. Regarding our methods, uh, our survey was opened on uh, the 1st of April 2020, so we are pioneering uh, in this uh, field of international survey uh, related to COVID 19. It was tested by the project steering group for the period of time before starting to speak it worldwide on uh, the 6th of April 2020. This survey was designed by the steering group of multi scientists scientists. Uh, from uh, Magdeburg and Münster in Germany, and involving also the uh, University of Sparta in Indonesia and the University of Palermo in France. The survey was then reviewed and edited by over uh, 70 colleagues and experts, experts worldwide, and we provided it in 13 languages. All questions were presented in differential format to be answered directly in sequence regarding the before and during confident condition. The survey was then uploaded and shared on the Google Online Survey platform. Uh, the first page was an introductory page describing the background and the aim of the survey, giving uh, information about the consultant, some exit information for participants, and the option to, uh, to choose one of the 13 available languages. Our questionnaire is a collection of validated and all business-oriented related questions, uh, which assess mental well-being, mood and feeling, life satisfaction, physical activity, type of behavior, social participation, sleep quality. And we add some specific questions related to technology behavior, uh, demographic information, of course, and the need of psychosocial system. Regarding the reliability of the adopted question and data privacy, the short and and the newly adopted question are to show good to extend and test the reliability of the question, uh, what we do uh, on 84 and 96. For a question that did not already exist in material consideration, we follow the process of translation and parameterization, and we make an additional review for all language versions from the international scientists of our consortium. The participants answered well and rules and confidential according to the Google privacy policy. By completing the survey, participants acknowledged their voluntary constant to participate in this anonymous study. At first, I would like to uh, share with you the preliminary results from the first thousand participants who uh, answered the survey during the first week of, uh, uh, of the simulation. Um, this uh, training results were published in a uh, form in a journal, and you know we get more than 1,100 citations. Uh, overall, the, the, the training sample includes uh, 1,047 participants, with 54 persons who were born. Uh, they are uh, um, 36 from Asia, 40 from Africa, and one from Europe and three from other continents. Uh, 
regarding the ethic of mutual of the non complement on mutual being the question life satisfaction and need of social support, we show that the proportion the proportion of people uh, who have low uh, who have their low mutual being was increased by 13 percent, while the proportion who declared the high mutual being decreased by 21 percent, meaning non complement compared to before non complement. Regarding the depression, also uh, there are uh, more people declaring the presence of depression with 10% uh, more in the proportion of these people. And regarding the access of depression, 10% uh, of people declare less declare the uh, access of depression. Regarding the life satisfaction, uh, there are 10 percent more people who declare to be uh, extremely dissatisfied or dissatisfied, and 20, uh, 22 percent uh, less people declare to be satisfied or extremely satisfied. Additionally, regarding our special question about the need of social support, uh, we found that there are 17 percent more people who uh, declare the need of social support in the country. Regarding the social and physical uh, activity, the sleep and life behavior, we show that uh, people who uh, are inactive uh, increased by 71% and active people increased by 55%. Uh, that means this is for the social participation, that's the social activity. Regarding the physical activity, the totally inactive people increased by 15%. And daily active people or uh, active people and increased by 20 percent. The sleep quality was also uh, disrupted in uh, Hong Kong England with a higher score of ACP in Hong Kong England compared to before Hong Kong England. And we have 13 uh, percent more people with poor sleep quality in Hong Kong England. Additionally, we have higher score in the type behavior. Uh, and this high score that uh, reflects the uh, inhealthy uh, diet behavior in Hong Kong. And if we have more people uh, compared to have inhealthy diet behavior uh, in Hong Kong compared to before, uh, people also relate to uh, be being eaten out of Hong Kong in confidence and to have snack between meals or to have late night snack uh, in Hong Kong. However, we have less people engaged in team uh, activity and this can be explained by the low access or the closure of uh, accessibility to uh, buying alcohol in Hong Kong. Regarding the energy expenditure in all uh, and classes, in the world, and classes, and classes, and classes are working, we have uh, less uh, energy expenditure uh, with between like 34 and uh, 42 percent. And most importantly, uh, the seeking hour has increased the income of women with uh, 3.10 uh, hours, uh, that's 28 percent more seeking time in Hong Kong Finland compared uh, to the Hong Kong Finland and this is in a line uh, of course the state in Hong Kong Finland. Uh, the people they care to use more of the uh, to spend more time using technology uh, using technology like internet social media especially for communication and also for some physical activity purpose. However, for, however, for that purpose, there are no difference in the use in the time for uh, technology to use. Uh, regarding the correlation, uh, we found that social participation is in that behavior and sleep behavior where the most of the more um, of the highest correlated value with mental well-being and the need of social support. So after, uh, the, uh, after this uh, preliminary results, we also start to analyze the full capacity uh, set of uh, 5056 uh, response and the uh, paper number 5 uh, focus mainly on the effect of physical activity level on sleep quality. And we show that uh, low active or lowly active people have uh, lower sleep 
quality of the report and also the opinions. But uh, as we have more really uh, active people here in uh, Hong Kong, we can get also a further higher score in PSU that's mean further poor uh, the quality here in Hong Kong. So as you can see, it's uh, totally related to the physical activity and the level of skin quality. And more we are connected the complement to get lower uh, skin quality. Then uh, in the number six, we focus mainly on the older adults, because this is the more vulnerable uh, population. And this uh, population was the first to see uh, construction for uh, social isolation or Hong Kong payment. Uh, so uh, from the total sample, we have uh, 570 uh, of the value from 53 countries. Um, two persons were female, and uh, half of them from Europe, uh, a third from America, six and nine persons from Asia and North Africa, respectively. Uh, in this paper, we focus mainly on the right mainly to determine the predictor of mental uh, of psychosocial strain in this population um, based on the demographic data, right behavior, uh, sleep quality, physical activity. So, we try to determine which are or what are the most uh, predictor variable for the psychosocial strain. So, at first, I, I, I will be uh, showing some results about confidence in the social strain in this population. So, uh, the frequency of people who are probably or uh, have uh, probably depression or positive depression uh, was increased by 13% uh, from before to gain confidence. And people with high mental impairment have uh, decreased to be. Uh, 18 persons from the uh, from before the income. Also, sleep quality was unclear in this population, and we have a uh, low uh, proportion of people with good sleep quality. Why we, we, we found more uh, people with poor sleep quality? And of course, uh, more people who are lowly active and less people who are highly active. So, um, then the mathematical question we try to find uh, the most important predictor of this social social strain. So, why is the first uh, model show that social, uh, social demographic variables and including age? Sex, continent, level of education, martial status, employment status, health status, house number, and uh, city failed to, uh, failed to um, predict or uh, predict the mental uh, being score. The model five, which is the final uh, model, was the best uh, over uh, model accounting for uh, 20, more than 20 percent. Uh, the bias in the developing score with uh, Delta uh, total risk score was the best single predictor of Delta in the developing, accounting for nearly 35 uh, persons and was followed by the Delta uh, or physical activity or energy expenditure by 28 persons, accounting for 28 persons of uh, the developing uh, bias. Over uh, the smaller the decrease uh, in the physical uh, in or physical activity level, the smaller you get uh, a decrease in the well-being. However, the smaller the increase is in the PSG uh, score, uh, the smaller the decrease in the well-being levels. In summary, the findings show that. Uh, had a negative effect on mental well-being and emotional status. We were the first to provide some uh, some data or some uh, uh, scientifically uh, validated proportion on low mental well-being. We have uh, more. We have nearly 30 percent 
uh, more people with mental pain, uh, 16 persons with uh, the mental disease, uh, 10 more persons with developing depression, and uh, 16 more persons uh, who detail uh, the need of psychosocial support. Uh, this negative psychosocial uh, emotional uh, effect of COVID-19 homophobia was shown to be defined by a negative effect on the majority of assessed lifestyle behavior with more positive impacted people, socially isolated, in a government, poor sleep quality and unhealthy diet behavior. Uh, and they especially show that low physically active people killing on walking show to have the poor sleep quality. In all that happened, the COVID-19 related lockdown significantly and the community affected sleep quality and physical activity levels. Uh, sleep quality and the physical activity and energy expenditure were significant indicator of the incident in the year from being to the lockdowns. And therefore, the public policy should put, put in place must consider this factor as levels for improving the well being of this population. Uh, Unfortunately, we also show that there, there is an increase in the number of people who were using technology. The preliminary results of the survey revealed the considerable burden for the community to our Indian lifestyle uh, enforced by the COVID-19, particularly social and physical inactivity, energy diet and poor sleep quality were associated with development and emotional well-being. This multidimensional negative effects highlight the importance for stakeholders. Uh, and policy maker to consider that the and the discipline and the function to mitigate the effort of physical and social strength. Um, we can promote well-being by encouraging individuals to engage in indoor and outdoor physical activity, of course, while talking with distances and reaching the communication. Since participants have demonstrated a higher acceptance toward technology, technological solutions in the continent, we can uh, foster or we can promote to foster active and healthy continent lifestyle via a nice and basic approach. The ECMB COVID 19 strategy to mitigate the psychosocial strain already published in the Environment Report. Is consists, consists of four steps. The first step was following them, which is the application of a national uh, survey. So we can really give us uh, data and we can identify this factor of the importance of social strain to better understand the need of the population during the pandemic. Uh, then the second step would be the development of a unique oriented intervention that should target the, the, the main uh, risk factors and improving the development of the simulated oriented intervention and we then deliver uh, the more to people, uh, in consumers. Therefore, the, in the third step, uh, we can promote physical activity and encourage the consumers to get it. And the final step is to develop and provide an affordable product from the ICT based company for the COVID 19 lockdown. This company should deliver the multi dimension service for each user to be modified the, 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 the needs uh, and the, 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 the disorder. Participation or in this user, and then uh, we have uh, a specific DSS which can uh, deliver the needed oriented recommendation for this user. So, based on the integrated approach, such as emotional and social computing, open social platform, interactive uh, coaching, communication, instructor, and the uh, optimism, and the uh, uh, smart digital solution. This company should be able to uh, provide personalized physical, mental, and psychosocial experience for the people. Then uh, it should be also able to deliver personalized multi dimensional pieces of health recommendation, such, uh, such solutions. Uh, it should facilitate user adherence to active and healthy complement lifestyle, achieve rapid psychosocial recovery, and enhance the preparedness for future. Uh, 
regarding the strength and the mutation. The strength of this study is that we were the third of we the first to launch such a national survey and the data was collected very quickly during the restriction using the only admins of this survey. Uh, the survey was provided in a multiple language and it was widely distributed in several continents. The limitations are especially that most participants were uh, 15 years older or younger, that's 90% of them uh, were, uh, were uh, middle adult uh, age. Uh, most of them were healthy and educated to uh, be beyond the high school. Um, and the evidence of demographic accuracy was not yet uh, studied. There are some methodological issues that can be uh, that can be uh, 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 that such as the use of cross-sectional design, assessing the before and after the condition retrospectively, and the use of OP-based or IP-based indicator to exclude duplicates. However, we have our reason uh, regarding this uh, issue. Indeed, IP or OP safety were avoided as they have not been more than one family number that is the same conclusion as we were happy. And uh, given that no confidence was a sudden measure in most countries, we were not able to develop and speed the survey at the form of So we uh, opt for the uh, retrospectively uh, design. The first step for this study is uh, to uh, ask you to uh, address the previous suggested as a relevant factor in groups. Our full collected data set, as in the 5,000 question, can be used to the future last post hoc study that can analyze the uh, difference between country, assessing the interaction between the mental, emotional, and behavioral strain the focal by COVID-19, and of course assessing the demographic and structural impacts. Uh, this information should provide better informed decision between future funding and sale process. Uh, if you are already working in this topic of human lifestyle, ICT solution, I would like to invite you to uh, submit a paper in our uh, special school in uh, media class. And you can, of course, get 25% discount for submission before the 25th of December. And also, uh, you are fully invited to submit your paper related to ICT basic uh, training and interaction for the application. If you are working with other agents or with uh, ICT basic uh, solution, thank you for your attention. Uh, we uh, compared to uh, other people. 
people uh, having their exploratory uh, problems. Thanks. Thank you for your question. So, uh, at first, we uh, did not make a lot of exclusion criteria. Uh, the main exclusion criteria were uh, related to uh, the problem, the, the, to measure uh, our quality of decline or uh, uh, degenerative uh, problems because uh, most of the questionnaires uh, are based on the on some memory. Uh, Capacity because they should answer uh, about the form of events that mean uh, like two weeks before or one month before. So, this was the main uh, exclusion criteria. Then, we didn't make exclusion criteria regarding age or regarding uh, health uh, cardiovascular status or other, uh, or other variables because we would like already to have different samples for post hoc analysis. So, we can, for example, compare between young and uh, uh, agent and other uh, between young adults and older people, or between those who have uh, who have characteristic attribution problem and those without. So uh, we make uh, the health question. They can uh, answer about their health status and collect all, all data. Uh, and for the and for the uh, their action, uh, we miss. To make this question if they are already affected or not, uh, so we don't have information if they are affected or, or not. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ashraf. So, uh, regarding the time, I'd like to welcome the next speaker and thank you, Ashraf, again. Um, so, speaker, I can already see your presentation. Vote. Um, the next speaker is Mortaza Tahiri. Sorry for my pronunciation. <laughs> yeah. And um, he's from Iman Tohimini International University in Iran. And he's an associate professor in physical education and sports science at the Faculty of Social Science in Iran. So maybe we do a sound check. And just as information for all of us, we have 30 minutes now for the next talk. So after 30 minutes, I'll stop you. And then we have five minutes for um, discussion. So Dr. can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. OK, perfect. Would you share the screen? Yes, but you can. Um, Click on the presentation mode because not right now we can see your working model on your presentation. Oh. <coughs> uh, would you please help me to share my file? I did not understand what you said. Please allow me to share my file. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, would you like to, oh yeah. to? Right now we can see all your slides, but you can leave it like that if it's okay for you. You can put it in full screen if you click on the simulation mode. Uh, uh, let me call through WhatsApp, video call, okay? Dr. 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 help me do so. You can just put in the presentation mode. It's a flat screen and the presentation right... Presentation mode? Yeah, the right... You see the right mode? Okay, where is the... Where is the link of presentation mode? Because I cannot see that. Yeah, I will help you. Hi, yes. Hi, yes. Where is the presentation mode? Yes. Okay,
Uh, I'm so sorry. I cannot. I cannot. I'm, uh, I have been defined as a role of guest. You should define my role as a presenter. Yes? Oh, but we can already see your presentation. So why I cannot see that? What's the problem? Well, that's hard for me to say because I cannot see your screen. When I see your screen, maybe you have two uh, screens. Two screens. We can see your oh. screen. It says key points of reviewing in high-ranked journals. So we see your first slide. But we uh, check on. And now, can you see the PowerPoint file now on the yes. screen? Can I stop in this way? We see your screen. Okay, can I start? Yes. Yes. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perfect. I start. And uh, can you see my face also? Um, I don't uh, I'm sorry, uh, can you see my face? No, your camera is too Or just seeing the screen on part of the file. Yes, could you please turn on your camera? Hello everybody, I'm very happy to present my presentation. Here I'm Dr. Monteza Tahiri, Associate Professor in Mount Community International University, Iran. Uh, first of all, I prefer to introduce myself and my background in reviewing uh, scientific journals. Uh, first of all, I was awarded as one percent top reviewers in high scientific journals worldwide, recognized by uh, Academy of Web of Science, Papalons, as you know. Uh, in this session, we want to talk about key points of review in high rank journals. As you know, if you know some standards, some key points, it can help you to prepare your papers in the best perfect manner, according to normal standards, and it can increase the chance and potential of your manuscript to be accepted in high rank journals. Let me go first slide. As you know, editor in chief and reviewers are two uh, important persons who can determine the chance of your uh, paper and manuscript to be accepted or rejected. So, in the view of editor in chief and reviewers, I want to present some comments, some common items that uh, can determine the chance of paper for, for example, being desk rejected or fast rejected first. In my opinion, and based on my uh, research, research experiences and my review experiences, the most important factor is research title. As you know, the uh, first thing that the reviewers or editor in chief pay attention to is research title. A research title, as you know, should have some characteristics that we uh, explain enough about it. First of all, it should have novelty and innovation. So maybe you have a question, how we can how can we recognize the novelty and innovation of research title? With a simple range with a simple search and by taking a look at some scientific database, the editor chief in the first glance can understand about the novelty and innovation of your research. For example, uh, searching about uh, research background, for example, Google search, PubMed, Observian, and some scientific database like this can simply uh, determine the novelty and innovation of your research. Now you can see an example. For example, it's just an example. We have a, a, a research title and we have submitted our paper to a very good uh, high rank journal. And for example, the research title is The Effect of Air Exercise on Depression of Honest Persons. So, 
anything can achieve just by one simple click on Google search can determine that, for example, 37,400 results are found regarding the offered or recommended research idea. So for sure, without any doubt, it will be this reject. So uh, it's very important, it's necessary to select a topic that uh, almost has no similar research title regarding that. It's very important factor. Uh, the other parameter that's very important uh, to include on your research topic is using those words that are categorized in MESH standard. MESH standard. Uh, so, uh, uh, at this moment, I want to explain uh, the importance and necessity of uh, putting the words based on MESH standard. The publishers, the editors, like to accept those papers which make the potential of the journals have more citations. And those words which are more, which have more potential to be cited in the scientific database have more chances. As you know, major standard include those words which are more frequently used in uh, scientific database, especially in our field of studies for scientists, sciences, exercise physiology, sport biomechanics, modern behavior, modern development. Oh, let me go to the page of the standard. It's a very simple word. For example, again, I want to determine the research title as the effect of exercise on a depression rate of, for example, other persons. So exercise. I want to check if exercise is mesh word, is based on mesh standard. If you type exercise here in black box, okay, exercise will be found here. But if you search, for example, physical activity, physical activity is not embedded in mesh standard. So it's better to use exercise instead of mesh standard. Okay, so the first section that editor in chief or reviewers have a very close uh, we want it, have a very have sensitive to it is research title. The second one is quick review and translation. I myself always uh, to my students, master or PhD students, that never try to translate your scientific text, text according to, for example, uh, Google Translate. It's a very big mistake. It's possible that, for example, the content, the content of your manuscript is very good, very nice, but unfortunately, because of uh, the poor translation, editor chief or reverse reject your manuscript. So uh, try to have your manuscript translated by a native translator. It's very important. The third element or the third factor that is of utmost importance in the view of editors and reviewers is references. Maybe it's a question, it's your question. Why are the references important? For example, you have uh, referred to some scientific texts that have references, but how important is it? You know that if you refer your paper uh, contents to some highly cited references, highly cited references, the chance of your manuscript to have more, to have increased, to have the increase of citation will be more and more. So the editors uh, will take a close look in this parameter. Using valid and updated references, for example, we are in the year of 2021, but by, uh, by taking a look at your final references of your manuscript, we can see that, for example, we have a reference of 1991, okay, about 30 years ago. 
So it shows that uh, the, your research idea is not well interesting because it may refer to, for example, the research idea may be historically long, more than 30 years ago. So updated references uh, is also important. But, uh, however, there's one point. Some of your works are being done according to a theory or hypothesis okay, that has new findings. So it refers to 30 years ago. In this occasion, no problem for referring your manuscript, for example, to all. Try to use some references which consist or which include PMID code number. So maybe you're asking uh, oh, what's the importance, what's the necessity of such a reference. All of you know that uh, NCBI or PubMed database has more capacity to be visited, to be searched by top researchers. So if you use some PMID references that can you see in the slide, yeah, those references which have PMID references can make the chance and potential of your manuscript increase in terms of uh, having more citations. So having PMID references is also important. Next. Um, the other factor and the other important parameter that is of utmost uh, importance is validity and reliability of research instruments. My friends, my colleagues, professors, and students, uh, just uh, we should be careful about these factors. These are all these are those which will be considered at first glance, okay? For example, editor is going to have a very quick review on the paper and specify the reviewers. Before sending the manuscript to the reviewers, he or she will check these standards. And after that, for example, you can select reviewers or you can, for example, have this rejection to your manuscript. So, uh, as I told you uh, just a month ago, validity and reliability of research instruments is very important. For example, which kinds of uh, instruments have been applied? Uh, do they have, for example, uh, well enough to be applied in such a research or not? And having a reference, valid re references for, uh, for example, ex such protocol, nutrition inter intervention, something like this. Ethical considerations, ethical considerations. It's very, 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 very important. And I, uh, I, will, tell, I will let you know what my reasons are, why I uh, concentrate and I focus on ethical considerations. Now, I can see some manuscript published in very high rank journals like Zenvir, I don't know, Plus One, Frontiers, and for example, they are related to animal lab experiments. According to the code standards, CO, as you know, is the Ethics, International Ethics Committee. All the procedures which company intervention for their study should include and should have ethical considerations. For example, suppose that you are working on rat or rabbit animals, okay? It's a kind of uh, experimental research. And after the end of the experiment, Unfortunately, we have to, we must kill the rats. Maybe I think that, okay, no problem. Why is there any urgent, for example, need to include the ethical code, ethical approval code for this, uh, such a research? You know that the math group, the research, the research procedure should be specified based on ethical committee decision. And that's why uh, such a decision is very important. As you can see on the yellow box, Institutional Ethics Committee approval and informed consent 
are obligatory parts in all interventional studies, both human or animal, without a doubt. So according, again, I emphasize on this issue, according to the code standards, code rules, all interventional studies, both human and animal, must have uh, ethical approval code. I know that the session uh, was started by a little late, so I try uh, to shorten my time. Mm -hmm. The other factor that uh, editor chief and reviewers consider seriously and with a close uh, consideration refers to introduction. For introduction section, necessity of research is very important. Okay. For example, they see that on your final references of your manuscript, is there any, any similar or close research idea the same as you know you did or not? What are, uh, what's the major uh, what, what's the major need of uh, doing the same research? You should solve the problem, you should uh, present some new idea, new findings by, uh, for example, uh, developing uh, such a research idea. So, uh, focus on presenting the necessity of research in introduction in at least one paragraph is very important. The second one, and in my opinion, uh, my friends uh, who are present uh, who, uh, who are present in Congress, uh, like Dr. Professor Handy, Dr. Travelsi, uh, Dr. Jamil, Dr. Pantelis, Dr. Anmar. Okay, uh, I'm very happy to see all of them here. All, all these people that I named them have very good and very high quality papers and manuscripts in uh, very high rank journals. What's the reason? What's the reason for their success? They always challenge a model or theory related to our field of study. I had a, uh, I had a research on two of my master's students. We investigate the contents and standards of those uh, those journals which are indexed in nature and science in our field of study for sciences. Most of them, most of them, challenge a model or theory related to sports sciences. It's very important. For example, for example, uh, just an example. Uh, we have a weight loss model, and uh, we can state that, for example, decrease your total calorie expense, uh, calorie intake. Try to increase your energy expenditure. So just very simple. But we have, for example, ignored the power of mind mentality in weight loss. So, if I design and I recommend a good model that uh, make uh, the previous model and theories doubtful, okay, it's a very really good, uh, uh, it's a very really good idea to make your paper pub uh, to make the chance of your paper being published uh, very high. As I told you, the other factor refers to uh, being different from previous research, as you know. Uh, I, uh, as an editor in chief, uh, checked the last point, one big mistake. Uh, you know that in the introduction, uh, many researchers try to magnify and try to restate the obvious and basic issues, and it's a very big mistake, and it can uh, lower the chance of your manuscript to be accepted. Another point, another point which refers to research design, showing research design by text or figures. For example, uh, as you can see on the, on the screen, in one study, you can see the uh, route, the research map, just by taking a look at the figure. In this, for example, figure, we can see that we have two groups, okay? The phases of research, uh, the phases of study has been shown, and everything is clear. 
So instead of writing, for example, two paragraphs to develop your research design, just you can, you can uh, have one figure or one diagram to uh, state your research design uh, more clearly. And the other one, uh, according to my experience, my regular uh, reviewing experience, uh, having flowchart for showing your sampling method, your research procedure is very important. You know that, for example, uh, it's a kind of joking. Uh, suppose that a reviewer is sleeping, for example, midnight, and he or she tries to uh, have a quick review on your manuscript. So by taking a very simple look on this flowchart, he or she can understand everything. Uh, instead of, for example, studying one or two paragraphs. So, uh, including flowchart is also important. What is us, dear professors, students, and audience? Uh, one of the new, one of the uh, new requests of uh, uh, famous publishers, the same as Science Nature or something like this, is asking you to provide you the raw data for them. It's very important. In this regard, for example, we have two uh, web companies, Manly and Dataverse. You can register in these two databases. You can put your raw data on Manly or Dataverse, and they can give you a code, a code number, the same as DOI. So if those publishers and those high-ranked journals ask you uh, to provide them with data reproducibility, you can give them this code. So try to study about it and try to provide your data okay, as soon as possible for all the works. I guess that in close future, this uh, facility and this facility uh, must be obligatory for all the journals. And the philosophy of such a service is preventing from data fabrication. For example, editors or reviewers firstly go to data reproducibility on the website and they can see that if data are, are original or uh, not. References, I'm sure that all of you know, uh, some uh, hybrid journals also nowadays never uh, make their reader, their uh, submitters, Obliged to use reference manager, but I think that in close future it uh, will be obligatory also. EndNote, as far as I know, is the most famous and uh, the easiest way to include your references as standard as possible. And cover letter, cover letter is also very important. In uh, how to write on cover letter is a technique. In cover letter, you must clarify your research idea. You must emphasize that your work has not been published or submit, submitted uh, anywhere else. You must <coughs> clarify that you have considered and regarded all ethical points. And finally, it's better to thank editors and reviewers for considering your work. In this short time, I try to do my best to uh, explain and present on my oral presentation. I hope that you will visit our program one day in close future because uh, we have an upcoming event for the next year. And uh, that was my honor to be uh, at your disposal for uh, today's uh, presentation. Thank you very much for all persons that hold this Congress. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm ready and I'm very prepared to answer the question. So, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear us? 
Oh, was the voice clear for all persons? No interruption? Because I can you, can you I continuously us? keep on presenting without stopping you. Can you hear us for your sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can hear you very well. Okay, thank you for your talk and presentation. So can you hear me now? Pardon, please. Any question? I'm ready. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Yes, I hear you. Okay, perfect. So, thank you very much for your presentation. And do we have any questions from the audience? In Europe. Il y a des questions. Vous pouvez poser en français, on va traduire. So if it's not the case, I I have a question. So um, in the eye of an author, would you recommend to choose the journal you want to publish before your strategy you presented, or? <laughs> yeah, I'm screaming. And um, would you choose? Would you choose? Um, or would you recommend to choose the journal before you start? to use the strategy you just presented? Or would you recommend to write your article and then choose a journal you want to present? Uh, lady, I'm so sorry. I cannot uh, hear very very well. So I do not understand what you said. Is one native? So the, the, the question, uh, Professor, is uh, should we uh, uh, target the first the journal to submit or to write the paper and after choose the journal? Which strategy you recommend? You mean that which one is priority? Okay? First writing the paper and research idea or first choosing the journal? Yes? Yes. Absolutely, in my opinion, it's a personal experience. Both of them uh, are very important. Both of them. You cannot, you cannot, for example, uh, choose the journal and after that you develop your research idea and something like this. Simultaneously, you should consider the journal and you should select the research uh, topic. Okay. Uh, between all the works that you have done before. Both of them are important. In my opinion, no one has priority over the other one. Was that clear? Thank you, thank you. Just one maybe last uh, uh, recommendation and I thank you for uh, uh, this very useful uh, presentation for our uh, postgraduate students. So this is thank a place you. to learn uh, if you want to publish and uh, to have successful uh, submission. As editor, why you don't uh, uh, like publish a paper in that regards? That would be very interesting for the reader. So, uh, is there any published paper that maybe discuss how maybe to write a paper? I know there is many uh -huh. books, but maybe for you as editor, can you maybe uh, recommend or write one paper in that regards? Uh -huh. You mean that, uh, for example, uh, what techniques are available to improve the quality of paper, yes? Did that understand well? No, not really. So, as you, as editor, why you don't put this information in one paper for the readers? That would be very helpful for students. Yeah, yeah, for sure, absolutely, uh, I can do that. Uh, for the Congress and for uh, using all audience, okay? Uh, after the Congress, I will provide uh, such kind of standards uh, and I will send it to Dr. Hadi or Dr. Khalid, okay? Okay. Thank you again uh, for your uh, participation. Another applause. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. They are all. I'm very happy to be at your disposal. I hope that all the presentation will be the best of your mind, my friends. Goodbye. All the best from Tunisia. Good. Uh,
Yes, I am. Yeah, I am. I am. So uh, I am uh, now uh, very happy and very honored to uh, present the next speaker. It's a very special uh, guest and a friend. Uh, so he is a professor from uh, the Institute uh, of uh, Germany and he is uh, leading uh, uh, a famous uh, team research that he is working uh, in applied science and specifically on balance and strength training and long-term development in uh, athletes. That's right. So uh, today, uh, Professor Ernst Granacher will uh, sh be sharing with us his expertise in uh, strength training and he will talk about the relevance and the effectiveness of resistance training and combined resistance and balance training in youth. And I ask the audience to give a really warm uh, welcome and uh, you have the stage uh, us. Thank you for uh, your participation. Merci beaucoup, Ernest. It's a pleasure to present here at your conference and uh, thank you also for the invitations and the organizers who made this possible. I know it's really difficult in times of COVID that technically allow such a conference. And I hope that you can hear me and see my slides. So the title of my talk today is Relevance and Effectiveness of Resistance Training and Combined Resistance and Balance Training in Youth. And I have changed my title slightly after having taught in it because a large part of our research, shared research, comes from that field, Resistance and Balance Training in Youth. Before I start out, I would like to quickly introduce you to where they actually come from. And here's a map of Germany and Europe, and you see uh, Germany in yellow, and you, most of you obviously know Berlin, and Potsdam is very close to Berlin, it's actually the capital of the state of Brandenburg within Germany. And here's our campus, this is the main campus of the University of Potsdam, it is located in the World Heritage Site and it was built in the 18th century by Frederick the Great One. So my labs are just next door from these famous buildings and my uh, lectures in exercise science and physiology are actually in that building, in the lecture hall. Now it is, uh, I would like to acknowledge um, our collaboration over the past years and uh, thank you very much and it's been a great pleasure to work with you. Uh, and especially with Dave Bain, of course, as well. This is a great team. Thank you very much. And I would also like to acknowledge the German Federal Institute of Sports Science because a lot of research I will go into and introduce in my talk has been funded by the German Federal Institute of Sports Science from 2014 up to 2024, so over a period of 10 years. And this all comes from the so-called KINGS study. And KINGS is an acronym, and it stands for Resistance Training with Young Athletes. And within that study, we focus on a performance-related perspective, but also, also on a health-related perspective. And the agenda of my talk is I, I basically highlighted five main topics. First of all, I would like to talk about the relevance of youth resistance and balance training. Second, effectiveness of youth resist resistance training. Third, effectiveness of combined balance and resistance training with youth and how to implement youth balance and resistance training. And I will sum up and uh, provide a few take-home messages. Now let me start out by telling you the most prevalent myth that still are around with regards to youth resistance training. The performance, if we want to assess the effect of strength training uh, on this uh, variable. Well, I'm not a psychologist, so I work with a lot of psychologists here at the University of Potsdam, for instance. But what we have done and made good experience with is with that concentration action procedure uh, and reason loss that is very easy to handle um, and very easy to, to assess as well. But you always have to look at what you actually want to assess and there is no such thing as one particular uh, test. And you know from the discussion with my colleague, 
as psychologists for it, they really recommend using digit simple tests. And the digit simple test is a very good test, the assessment of cognitive function in youth as well. It is easy to implement, it can be done using tablets or paper pencil version, so both is possible. Thank you. I think we have uh, also a question from uh, Ashraf Amar, who is now also staying in Germany and he specialized in weightlifting. So, Ashraf, uh, your question, please. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Nanaka, for this interesting presentation. So, I will just refer to the, to the first uh, slides of this presentation regarding the standardism or recommendation or guideline for uh, the upgrading program. So I, I think um, I'm not uh, very um, in favor of the standardism guideline, uh, especially if we know that uh, ethnicity, gender, uh, and uh, specific age of uh, young or childhood uh, um, affects the, the model performance in uh, effective model performance. So we, we have already worked with the uh, German model test and we did uh, a comparison between uh, German uh, uh, children and uh, Egyptian children and we, we found a lot of difference between them, also difference between boys and girls, uh, the age group. And I think the recommendation should be more personalized. So for example, we, for the strength, Training, we, we recommend to focus on it of the age of six, eight for Egypt and uh, eight, ten in German female because they have a decline the state. And for the boys, we should, for example, focus more on the lowlands, however, girls, the whole body. So I think now it's time to make a worldwide uh, study that, uh, that investigate at first the need of, the, of this population. Where are the decline, especially in each age, in boy, in, in, in female, in which motor, like most motor uh, uh, capacity or uh, abilities, and then to make this training uh, the recommended training program. Okay, I should okay. So, uh, I think this was a comment, right? I, I didn't quite get the question. So, can you repeat the question in one sentence, please, uh, Ashraf? Yes. Uh, do you think that we should now go for more worldwide uh, study to define the needs in each, for example, country or each region, so that we can uh, suggest or we can recommend more personalized uh, training program? Well, personalized training is always good. If, if we have the information to personalize training, that great. And of course, the adaptive level is always was comfortable or is uh, relies on really needful fitness level. If you have a low fitness level, then these general physical activity guidelines have a major impact on your health status. If you become active and, and sedentary before, this is great, right? But if you are already on a high fitness level, then following the average fitness and the average physical activity guidelines will not be sufficient anymore. This is basically the law of diminishing returns. And based on that law of diminishing returns, we need personalized training for those who are actually already fit. But for those who are sedentary and fit, they can follow the physical activity guidelines. And to answer your question with one sentence, um, I think in the meantime, especially with youth, we have so much evidence that become less fit, they don't follow physical activity guidelines. It's not that much anymore we lack evidence. It is more the issue how to bring this to the people, how to make them active. This is the most important part, and there we need not only researchers, but also politicians worldwide. Thank you. Uh, Earth, uh, I will finish by uh, one question because we have a lot of uh, postgraduate students here and they are thirsty about maybe uh, to know some uh, future direction for research. So what you advise them, which area they can now uh, study in their uh, like PhD or master research? What do you think is now interesting to do? 
Uh, personally, I think the, the feel of innovative action, especially when you think of good cognitive mode of performance uh, at that crossroad, how can we back uh, cognitive performance in you through physical activity programs and specific physical activity programs? This is a very important issue. And let me tell you one more, or one, one sentence in the end. If I talk to politicians here in Germany, uh, then they're not really, or very often not interested in if you talk about physical exercise. But as soon as you start talking about transfer effect from physical exercise to cognitive performance and cognitive development, they start listening to you, right? And therefore, at this crossroad, cognitive motor interaction, I think this is where we should further go into. Thank you, Gellers, for uh, your presentation, and of course uh, we will talk uh, about some future uh, study uh, from uh, Tunisia. Thanks again. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Elias. I'm happy to answer questions through emails later on if you like. So if further questions come up, thank thanks. You for your time. Uh, okay, I am a pleasure to go to the next uh, speakers. So. Uh, Dr. Jacobs, you are here, you listen? Uh -huh. Yes, hello, good okay. morning, welcome, welcome. Thank you uh, for uh, your participation to our international congress. So, Dr. Jacobs is from uh, Milano, Italy, so you are so close from here. <laughs> <No more. laughs> yeah. And yes. uh, he's working in the laboratory of movement and sports science institute, orthopedico in Galizia. Galizia. Galeazzi. Galeazzi. Almost perfect. Okay, so almost perfect. Now we are not so far. So the title of the presentation is about the role of sleep nap for athletes. So a very close topic to the research that is doing here in the Institute of Scott. So of course so I think the, our students and colleagues will be very attentive to your uh, uh, talk. So we have the stage. Thank you, Anis. Uh, first of all, I'm going to share the presentation. And can you just please give me a feedback? And if you see the screen? Yes, yes. Perfect, thank you. So, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jacopo Vitale. I'm working as a researcher at the Galeazzi Orthopedic Institute of Milan. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Ani, Mohamed, and Amdi for the invitation. And I'm very happy today to talk with you uh, today about the role of sleep and nap for, uh, for athletes. Um, I decided to start the presentation with the pictures of these four great Italian athletes, Olympic athletes, that uh, obtained uh, gold and silver medals during the last Olympic and Paralympic Games. Um, and of course they won these medals because of their talent, their commitment during the training in the last five years, but also uh, it is important to underline uh, that they recognize the importance of sleep for their performances because they were part of a large group uh, working on sleep uh, together with me and Professor Antonio Latore, which is the technical director of the Italian Track and Field Federation. And so uh, the take-home message is that, of course, you cannot win only uh, uh, with sleeping, uh, reaching the correct amount of sleep, of course, but it is important that Italian athletes at least are now recognizing the importance of sleep and they are working on sleep with a scientific approach. So, today, uh, this is the daily program of my presentation. I'm going to talk with you about sleep uh, with a chronobiological approach because we can approach sleep from different sides, but I think that the chronobiological approach is the most appropriate with athletes. And I will focus on uh, also adenosine as a possible sleep factor. 
Then we will focus on the behavioral and training factors that are able to affect the sleep of the elite athletes. We will share some information about the assessment methods for sleep and also about the impact of acute uh, sleep restriction on uh, the performances of athletes. And then, last but not least, we will talk about the NAP, uh, which is a very strong weapon uh, for athletes to recover from a sleep uh, restriction uh, period. So we will try to understand if and when um, it is correct to adopt uh, an acting strategy. So first of all, just a few slides uh, on a theoretical part concerning sleep. Uh, everybody knows that chronobiology is the science that studies the human rhythms in general. We can observe different rhythms in humans. Uh, the most common, let's say, the most studies, uh, studied uh, rhythms are circadian rhythms, which refer to a 24-hour period about. Uh, but what is important to say is that our human rhythmicity, uh, circadian rhythmicity, is uh, controlled by both endogenous and exogenous uh, factors. The endogenous factors uh, are located uh, in, the, uh, in our brain, in the suprachiasmatic nucleus of our hypothalamus, and also we can observe the uh, autonomous synchronization of uh, peripheral organs in, uh, in uh, our human body, of course. But the endogenous component is uh, strongly influenced by exogenous external factors. These factors in chronobiology are called synchronizers, and the primary synchronizers in humans, so for athletes too, are, is the light-dark uh, cycle. Why light uh, is so important for our circadian uh, rhythms? Uh, uh, because light stimulates our wake center in the brain. So uh, our body clock is located, as said uh, previously, in the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus. And uh, of course, uh, lights can have several effects on our circadian expression through the suprachiasmatic nucleus. For example, light uh, inhibits, may inhibit the melatonin production, and melatonin is an hormone promoting sleep, so we can understand now that light is also important for sleep too. And also, for example, following um, activation by light, we can observe in our brain a glutamate release, uh, which is uh, the strongest excitatory neurotransmitter for humans, uh, which lead to an increase in dopamine too, and so in a, uh, that lead ultimately to an increase in our neural activity. So uh, lights uh, can promote our wake center and can help us to to stay awake. We, this is a uh, this is a key important information to know. Um, it is also easy to understand, uh, it, it is important to, to highlight that uh, there is a strong relationship between human sleep and biological rhythms. As you can see in the left, on the left side of the uh, slide, we can, you can observe the uh, circadian rhythm of melatonin and cortisol in 24 hours. And at the beginning and at the end of the sleeping period, which is represented by a light blue uh, bars, um, you can see that these two hormones uh, have a strong response uh, uh, in relation to sleep onset and sleep onset, because we uh, start to sleep when we increase uh, our melatonin levels and also during the sleep we lower, we significantly lower, we observe lower values of cortisol and also we have our peak of our body cortisol, uh, blood cortisol or salivary cortisol uh, about uh, 30 minutes after waking up, so that, that is called the cortisol waking response. 
This actually happens in a physiological or in normal condition in healthy controls, as you can see again here in this graph. But um, as you can see uh, in the slide, uh, in people affected by uh, insomnia, the circadian rhythmicity, the uh, circadian uh, rhythm of cortisol is totally lost. Uh, it is totally flattened and uh, we can have uh, higher and higher levels of cortisol during the 24-hour period, period during the day and of course this can have health and performance consequences so this is why sleep is so important for for our uh, circadian expression and also you can we can observe this trend also for other anabolic hormones such as the growth hormone which is which reach the peak its peak during the first phase of the sleep period but the peak of growth hormone is totally lost in a condition of sleep deprivation so in subjects without sleep uh, this is a key uh, and this should be uh, we have to take this information in mind concerning the relationship between sleep and biological rhythm so, uh, this is uh, one of the most cited and presented models of sleep regulation, the two process model of sleep regulation, in which uh, the process S and the process C works together uh, to guarantee uh, the correct sleep regulation. The process C is, uh, represents our uh, circadian expression, our circadian rhythmicity, and one of the markers of the process C could be, for example, uh, melatonin, cortisol, of any hormone showing a 24-hour period uh, of uh, circadian rhythm. Whereas the process S represents the sleep pressure or the sleep depth. And one of the markers of this uh, sleep pressure is during the day is uh, adenosine. Let's talk about uh, quickly about adenosine, which will be also uh, cited and discussed when we will talk about netting. That's why it is important to know what is adenosine. Uh, so it is a nucleoside, uh, an ubiquitous uh, nucleoside, which is involved in sleep regulation. And it is known that adenosine um, accumulate within the brain during period of wakefulness or during period of sleep restriction. So, higher level of adenosine within the brain means lower glutamate, lower dopamine, and so uh, higher level of sleepiness. So, uh, this is uh, so important, especially because uh, adenosine can have some functions, uh, physiological function and actions on a specific area of our brain, uh, specifically in their anterior cingulate cortex. Um, and this area is uh, strongly involved in uh, emotional uh, processing and control, in perceived exertion, in self-regulation, and so on. And lastly, uh, we have to cite that the molecular structure of adenosine as you can see here, is quite similar to the uh, molecular structure of caffeine, which can bind to cell membrane uh, receptors for adenosine, blocking their action. So the caffeine in the brain inhibits the inhibitory actions of adenosine. Okay? Lastly, as a, uh, for the first theoretical part of the presentation, uh, we, you can see here, which is uh, in this diagram, the effect, the physiological effect of the mental, me mental exertion, okay, mental fatigue on, uh, on our brain, leading ultimately to an increase in perceived exertion and uh, also to a decrease in performances uh, for athletes. And this, uh, this algorithm, let's say this uh, uh, diagram, can be also true for uh, sleep deprivation or sleep restriction because the mechanism, the physiological mechanisms are quite similar between uh, uh, sleep deprivation and between uh, mental value of mental exertion because we observe, as said before, an increase in adenosine 
in increasing interstitial exception, which is one of the leading factors for athletes performances, especially for one uh, for endurance performances. So this is not the only physiological uh, mechanism that can explain the effect of sleep restriction or deprivation on performance, but it is uh, one of the uh, physiological mechanisms that needs to be uh, cited, of course. So now let's talk uh, directly and more practically about sleep. So, of course, as we said, sleep is a biological process. We need to consider and study two main uh, uh, variables, quantity and quality. Uh, as uh, presented by the National Sleep Foundation, for example, we need to sleep as adults uh, or young adults between seven or nine hours during the day, which is almost uh, one third of our day and also one third of our life. So it is a significant amount of uh, our life. So this is the volume, but also uh, it is not uh, sufficient to study uh, sleep volume. We need also to consider sleep uh, quality and one of the parameters of sleep quality is for example sleep efficiency uh, which indicates the actual uh, amount of sleep uh, during uh, the time spent in bed by, uh, by the subjects and if sleep efficiency is higher than 85% we can uh, be happy. So if an athlete sleep at least 7 hours with a sleep efficiency of 85% we are happy about that. If not, we can try to understand why this happened and try to find some solutions. So, which are the role of sleep for athletes? We can, we, we already mentioned a lot of uh, functions uh, of sleep, but we can uh, uh, still mention some other uh, physiological mechanisms which are essential for athletes. For example, in, within the brain, it is known that sleep has a positive impact on uh, memory, learning, uh, decision-making, problem-solving and reaction time. Uh, sleep can also have strong regulation concerning our emotions. So uh, when we are sleep-restricted, we are uh, uh, a little bit... Uh, our mood is totally alterated and higher level of anxiety or depression can negatively impact sleep, but also uh, sleep restriction can increase the anxiety levels uh, or stress levels in humans. So uh, this is a vicious cycle that needs to be uh, considered and need to be stopped in some case. And also from a physiological, uh, physical point of view, as we said, sleep uh, determines lower cortisol level, higher test testosterone and grow hormone levels. It can impact uh, the microfibrillar protein synthesis, uh, uh, can regulate sleep also the heart rate, heart rate variability, blood pressure, um, in general the immune system and so on. So many, many functions that can have a, a, a key role also, also for, uh, for athletes. So how do uh, athletes actually sleep? Uh, athletes would like and sleep a little bit more than normal people, so they would like to sleep between 8 and 10 hours, but data, scientific data, tell us that the the 75% of Olympic athletes that participated at the Olympic Games in Rio uh, slept, uh, slept less than 7 hours, which is uh, an insufficient uh, time, uh, sleep time. So, and we are still waiting to, to see what happened in Tokyo. So we need to uh, consider that mm, athletes, just like the general population, do not reach the correct amount of sleep. And we have also to consider some uh, demographic and uh, background variables that can impact the athlete. For example, the sport discipline. It is known that team sport athletes such as soccer players, uh, soccer players, uh, volleyball, basketball, uh, cricket, and so on, um, 
are more evening oriented, tend to be more evening time uh, than the individuals for athletes. So that means that they have delayed sleep wake cycle, delayed bedtime and get up time. Whereas individuals for athletes such as marathon runners uh, or long distance runners, cyclists, triathletes and so on, they tend to be more morning type, so they have uh, earlier wake up time and, uh, and get up time and bedtime of course, so we need also to consider this variable and also unfortunately for women in this case, so just like for the general population, uh, female athletes, uh, female subjects uh, sleep in general a little bit worse than males and also males, uh, it is important to know that males athletes tend to be more evening oriented if we talk, if we consider their chronotype. So chronotype means their predisposition to be a morning type or an evening type. Males tend to be evening types. Okay. So, which are now the, uh, let's call the behavioral, behavioral and environmental factors influencing the sleep of our athletes? We can observe many, many factors. Of course, the uh, non-correct light exposure, exposure to light, as we, as you now uh, know, uh, light can uh, uh, inhibit melatonin production, stimulates the wake center, so light exposure needs to be controlled and studied in athletes. Of course, stress and anxiety related, for example, to an important competition or to some personal problems or familiar problems can impact sleep and this need uh, uh, can uh, need uh, uh, and uh, work with a uh, uh, with a psychological, with a psychological approach, with a psychological expert, for example, um, one of the variables that we most commonly observe is the lack of uh, the education on, on the importance of sleep. I mean, many many athletes do not even recognize the importance of sleep for their health, for their career, for their performances. So, the first things to do is sleep education. This is an important variable. Of course, we have another big problem, especially with young athletes, concerning the use of electronic devices and social media. And um, this is also uh, related to the to the screen of our uh, laptop, uh, mobile phone, uh, television, and so on, which uh, uh, which release. Uh, a blue emitting light, the blue light is uh, the most powerful light that can uh, inhibit the melatonin production. So that blue light of the screen uh, can um, can inhibit uh, our sleep onset. So we need also to consider this variable, of course. We don't have a lot of time today to talk about this, but of course. Uh, uh, international level athletes has to face a lot of troubles uh, for uh, international competition. So the jet lag symptoms and uh, the problems related to the desynchronization of the human circadian body uh, clock uh, can uh, need uh, attention and need to be controlled and studied. Also, the consumption of caffeine and alcohol can be an issue. But lastly, uh, there are also some training factors that are able to influence the athlete's sleep. So let's talk about the training factors influencing uh, athlete's sleep. We can recognize mainly these factors. So, for example, training in altitude and or hypoxia condition, especially um, above 2,000 meters can lead to sleep disturbances in the first two days, three days of training uh, at altitude. Uh, also, the variation of duration and intensity of the training, which defines, uh, which defines together the training load, can uh, be uh, a problem for sleep. So, 
faster and uh, high variation of the training load, for example, within uh, a month, within a week of an athlete, can lead to sleep disturbances. So we have to pay attention about the training load of the athletes. And also, we need to, con to consider the time of day for training or for competition, because early morning training can uh, reduce sleep volume. And also, even in competition with high intensity, uh, physical demand and arousal level can impact uh, negatively sleep. And also, as we said before, the sport discipline, the habitual training type and the chronotype of the athletes can have a role uh, for uh, the sleep of athletes. So all this variable needs to be correctly studied and balanced uh, to uh, take the best actions with our athletes. Just one slide on a, an important variable, which is the night, the effect of the, of the night or even in competition of sleep, because many, many athletes, for example, soccer players uh, playing in the Serie A in, uh, in Italy, report that after a night match they cannot sleep. And the question is why? And it is always like this. Uh, why? Why? Uh, because we can. We have many environmental and physiological factors that can negatively influence sleep. So, uh, performing a soccer match, for example, uh, so with a higher, higher level of motivation and arousal, can be can lead to some physiological consequences that can impair sleep, such as the increase in cortisol, in body temperature, the increase in the sympathetic hyperactivity, uh, muscle pain, uh, psychological arousal, and so on. But we have also to consider, for example, the environmental factors. So play now, uh, fortunately now, there, uh, we have uh, people in the stadium uh, after one year and a half without people due to the COVID issue, but now we have people and playing in front of 80,000 people, for example, uh, with higher level of light exposure also because the light of the stadium is, is so strong, can inhibit the melatonin production, as we said before, so all these variables can impact the negative sleep. Actually, this is not always like this. It also depends um, on the timing between uh, the, the end of the competition and the bad time. So we need to, to have our, our athletes to spend at least three hours after a night match before going to bed if we want that uh, their sleep is good enough uh, in the night following the night, uh, uh, the night competition. Okay, so uh, it, it is also important to, to know how to study uh, athlete sleep. So uh, we need to collect both uh, data, I mean subjective and objective data. Subjective data relates to a wide range of scales, questionnaires, sleep diaries, and so on, validated, uh, scientific validated uh, in, a, in a various languages, and which are very essential to understand how the athletes perceive their sleep quality and quantity and so on. Whereas we have also to uh, co collect data in a objective uh, with objective tools. The gold standard for sleep is the polysomnography, but actually it is a little bit uh, uh, invasive and uh, with high cost, and uh, it requires hospitalization and familiarization. So probably it is not the best option with athletes. And also uh, another option which is valid and a little bit more cost effective is actigraphy. Actigraphy, which, what is actigraphy? I mean, um, actigraphs are three axis accelerometers that can uh, collect sleep for many, many consecutive days. They are typically versed the actigraphy, actigraphies, so uh, they can, we can deliver uh, the actigraph to an athlete and an athlete, an athlete can um, wear the actigraph in different conditions for many, many days. So 
uh, I can observe the sleep of athletes in a real life condition without requiring hospitalization and familiarization. So this is actually now the best options. And as you can see in the slide, for example, um, I reported uh, an example of an actogram uh, of uh, an Italian gold medalist athlete in Tokyo 2020. And this blue, uh, the blue bar represents the uh, sleeping period. And as you can see, uh, in 2019, we collected data of about these athletes during Italy, during an Italy training camp, during a, a travel in Japan. So this tool, uh, actigraph, actigraphy, can can be the be the best option for uh, to study sleeping athletes. Just to to share with you another information, these are new some of the new generation devices. My opinion is that we are now in a transition phase toward these devices, but actually they are not so valid and not so comfortable, such as the actigraphy. So now my personal uh, best option uh, is actigraphy. Okay. So um, now let's. I, I would like to present to you uh, two studies uh, concerning the effect. Um, that we conducted uh, here in Italy on the effect of sleep restriction on uh, on performances, and this first study uh, with for with this study we evaluated the uh, the effect of uh, um, of simple and combined uh, sleep restriction and mental fatigue on the free throw uh, performances of uh, basketball players. So this is the study design we collected. Um, data in two different conditions. In a normal sleep condition and in a sleep restriction condition, in a in acute sleep restriction condition, uh, condition where so in acute sleep restriction means that we restricted the sleep period um, up to uh, five hours per night uh, with the basketball players just for one night. So uh, in these two different experimental condition. Uh, we had our players in the gym, we asked them to perform 60 free throws uh, with a basketball ball, of course, with the same uh, uh, condition, temperature and so on. After the first 60 throws, they uh, watched a 30-minute video uh, aiming to uh, increase their mental fatigue to and the cognitive uh, uh, and the cognitive fatigue, and then they throw again 60 uh, 60 free throws. Uh, they perform 63 free throws again, and uh, as said before, in a normal sleep condition and in a sleep restriction condition. So these are the results of the study. Uh, what is most important to say to me is that we uh, uh, observe in the three experimental conditions, I mean mental failure, sleep restriction and the combination of sleep restriction and mental failure, a drop of the 7% of the free of the free throw accuracy of the basketball players. And given that um, the free throws represent the 20-30% of the um, total uh, score of the basketball players having a drop of 7% of, of the free, free throw accuracy to me uh, is, a, is an important result, is a key result that need to be considered because I can understand from the study that just one night of sleep restriction can impact the accuracy of the basketball players, so I need to have my basketball players to, to sleep well. In the second study, we had another uh, similar design because we um, evaluated the effect of acute sleep restriction on sport specific and athletic performances in union in a tennis uh, in union tennis players. And what we observed was quite interesting. Interesting because we observed a significant drop, uh, decrease of the accuracy of the um, 
tennis shots. I mean, uh, the right serve, the left serve, the cross court forehand, and the cross court backhand were negatively impacted by one night of sleep restrictions. But the ability to perform uh, uh, repeated sprints, okay, uh, was not negatively impacted by um, the sleep restriction. So we concluded that acute sleep restriction can affect uh, only sport-specific and uh, um, those physical performances of athletes that. Um, um, with, with, a, with a higher, with a higher cognitive um, um, requirement, okay, but not the, the pure uh, ability to perform, for example, a, a stream. So sleep can impact different components of the athlete's performances, not the all components of the of the athlete's performances. So finally. Uh, Going through through the end, let's talk about the nap. So uh, the question is, uh, the big question is, to nap or not to nap? Uh, is this uh, a good strategy for athletes or not? And when we were in Vancouver uh, during the World Sleep Congress in Canada in uh, uh, 2019, uh, together with uh, Professor Shona Alston, Mathieu Nedelec, Michele Lastella, and other uh, experts in the field of, uh, concerning sleep of athletes, we, um, we decided to try to answer to this question with a scientific uh, finding, a scientific answer. So we performed um, a systematic review concerning the effect of uh, napping on the performances of athletes. So, before showing you the results of this, uh, of, the, of, of uh, the results of our systematic review, uh, this is a, a slide that can make you understand that nap is very, very common and very, very important for athletes because this is. The napping behavior of five long distance runner, uh, Italian uh, Olympic long long distance runner, and um, as you can see, they tended to nap, uh, to take a nap, many many times uh, during the day uh, in different condition, uh, in, during baseline condition, during the training camp. Uh, during international competition too, uh, and so on. So this is a, a common strategy uh, for athletes to recover for uh, in response to a sleep restriction period, but we need to control two key variables if we want that the net is effective. And the two variables are uh, timing and duration. So. <coughs> Pardon, just, yeah, we need uh, also, we can just uh, classify uh, also the NEP into two main categories, um, which are a prophylactic, uh, prophylactic uh, NEP, which is taking in advance of a sleep restriction period, recovery NEP, which is taking in response of a sleep restriction period, and the appetitive NEP, which is taken just for for enjoyment, let's say. And as you can see, now we are here uh, in this slide, we can still talk about adenosine that, as you uh, can observe, is uh, can um, the, we observe higher level of adenosine um, at the end of the day or in a sleep deprivation or in a sleep restriction condition, but the net has the potential to lower the adenosine level. So uh, we need to consider the physiological role of net, which is which exists, which has already been scientific documented. Uh, and so we need to this is our starting point to, to study the net in athletes. So I'm going to be very fast now. Uh, I'm very close to, to finish my presentation. Anyway, as said before, we need to consider duration and timing because if the net is brief, short, or long, uh, we have different effects, uh, as you can see on the left 
side of, of, our, of my slide now, um, we have different effects of the cognitive performances in human, for example. Because if the net is long, we observe an initial decrease of the cognitive performances, and this is called typically sleep inertia. Okay, so the napping duration is crucial, and also we need to consider timing because napping in the morning or napping in the evening is not the same and uh, can impact the, the sleep structure of the nap itself, but also the sleep architecture of the following night. So. These are the results of the systematic review and the answer to the question to nap or not is yes, of course, because we observed many, many, many studies also uh, performed and conducted by uh, some colleagues uh, from this Fax University uh, that highlighted that nap can have positive effect on physical cognitive performances sleepiness, uh, on perceived exertion, on the psychological and mood states of effort, but we need to consider these three gold role, rules, key rules, which, is, uh, which are first, the timing of napping, uh, the best timing for napping is between 1 and 4 p.m., that means that it's not too close to the following night, because Having an app close to the to the following night can impact negatively impact the, that night. So that is the best timing. The nap should be between 20 and 90 minutes and uh, not too too long. And uh, also we need to consider at least 30 minutes to reduce the sleep inertia prior to training or competition by athletes. If we would like to avoid the first initial decrease of the cognitive or in general of the performances of our methods before starting training or competition. So, thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'm happy to answer to some questions if you have some. Thank you. I cannot hear you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jacob, for uh, this uh, very comprehensive uh, view uh, on the effect of sleep and for the, your publishing the study in the field. So uh, I am. Uh, who has a question? Okay. Can you come down? Are you sure to work? Can you not smile? Então, on va traduire pour gagner du temps. Dans le mal de compétition, je te lis. Non Thank you for uh, your presentation. Okay. Thanks for uh, your presentation. Uh, I want to ask uh, how can we deal with the. Uh, uh, I, I cannot hear. I cannot hear you. Okay, I, I, I will repeat the question for you. Thank you. Thank you. How can we deal with the competition uh, in the night? Uh, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe, uh, some uh, some matches are playing in the day at night, so uh, that may affect uh, the sleep and the quantity and the quality for the athletes. And uh, you know, uh, the rest, the time rest and uh, is too short. Uh, they can play even uh, 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 three matches per per, uh, per week, so it's important to uh, to give athletes. Uh, the question, the question, please. What's what are your recommendation uh, to give the athletes the best uh, uh, time to, to sleep, especially when they are when they are playing at, at, uh, late at, at night. For uh, congested uh, schedule uh, during the week, when we have more than one uh, game uh, in the week, so the time is very short for the, the sleep. So, what recommendation you can give to the coaches for uh, recovery, for better recovery? Okay, thank you for the nice and interesting questions. We need uh, more scientific evidences to answer to these questions, but. 
um, with my previous experience uh, in, uh, when facing this uh, context, first of all, we need to consider to obtain, uh, to do sleep bank, to do sleep banking. What I mean is to uh, collect uh, a large amount of sleep in the weeks uh, before, prior to the congested uh, uh, sleep, uh, congested uh, week, uh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, going, uh, suggesting athletes to go through a sleep extension period through uh, prior to this uh, week full of uh, congested uh, competitions or training is uh, uh, a crucial and uh, important strategy. Then, of course, uh, napping between uh, uh, matches or competitions, following the rules of time, duration, sleep inertia, is another variable, is another uh, strategy that can be useful uh, as a sleep extension, as a sleep banking strategy. So, uh, it depends also on the sport discipline, but this are the two uh, suggestions that I would advise. So, sleep banking prior to that week and within that week, napping following the, the, rule, the rules of uh, napping. Thank you, Simon. You have completed the uh, extension of your sleep before, anticipate, and do the napping the last week. Okay, I would have uh, uh, some small question, Jacob, because it's uh, yeah, very, yeah. very yeah. obvious. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. I think uh, what is missing in your presentation is the nutritional factor. So, because it's very important uh, uh, this uh, complex interaction between uh, time, sleep, exercise, nutrition, and uh, chronobiology. So, of first, first of all, so who has the power when we talk about exercise and sleep? Is the sleep uh, restriction impact more or the exercise, for example, evening impact more? Because there is controversy now. Some studies show also that even we have high intensity evening exercise, it can, uh, it's okay for. Uh, for uh, yeah. uh, second small question can we talk about threshold? So, because when you give your recommendation, it's very large, but we need to nap from 1 to 4 pm. So, Again, at the time, also the nap is very large. So, is, the, is, is there really any any uh, result uh, for acute effect? Okay, but what about chronic effect? So, can we say that maybe athletes or elite athletes are accustomed or familiarized about uh, sleep uh, sleep loss? And do you think that what we have now, or what uh, until now, the data collected in the world, because all most of them are uh, subjective measure, so we can have uh, external validity of the results. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. So many important questions. So concerning the relationship between sleep and exercise, and as you said. Uh, uh, I mean, the, there is uh, a lot of discrepancies related to the methodological issues uh, in the different experimental studies. So we can say also uh, to answer to your last question about the chronic effect of the restriction on performances that we can say with almost uh, certainty that uh, uh, the acute sleep restriction can impact performances with a higher uh, cognitive demands of athletes. But uh, it is not enough to affect, for example, the ability to sprint, the ability to jump, or the ability to perform a long distance uh, running. So the chronic effect of sleep restrictions uh, can be uh, I mean, sleep deprivation, which is the total loss of, uh, of sleep, uh, is never, or is almost never observed in a real life condition with adults, but it is observed in some studies, in some experimental conditions. But we need to pay attention most to the chronic sleep restriction. So, chronic sleep restriction can be very, very dangerous. 
uh, not only for the performances, but also for the health consequences of athletes. I mean, higher cortisol level, lower testosterone level, and so on. So, uh, I would avoid, in any case, that condition, but for sure, chronic sleep restriction can impact more aspects of the athlete's performances. I, then I totally agree with you that nutrition cannot be ignored if we talk about sleep or sleep hygiene strategies, for example. And uh, we need to know that the timing, for example, for dinner is essential for the sleep onset and sleep, and sleep quality. So we need to have at least three hours between the dinner and the bedtime if we want to have a correct sleep latency and sleep onset with athletes, of course. And also the meal composition is important. So having a high index carbohydrate is good to sleep and have lower rate of protein is also good for sleep. My opinion with my previous experience with the Olympic uh, Italian athletes. I hope that I had uh, I provided some useful information or, or answer. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, bye-bye. Yeah, thank you very much. I think, uh, yeah, well, we could discuss about this topic a uh, long time more, but uh, we need to go further to the next um, speaker. That is uh, Khulut Matiba from Qatar University. Um, are you there? Yes, hello. Perfect. Yeah. So welcome to the Congress. We are very, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. And um, you will talk about the effect of passive and active hypothermia on uh, proprioception. And I think you will introduce yourself a little in the beginning. But as I said, you are from Qatar, in, uh, from Doha in Qatar. And uh, your research is on the effect of passive and active hypothermia on proprioception and posture um, stability. So again, welcome. and. We will listen to your talk and presentation now. Thank you so much. Would you like to share Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot hear you clearly. Oh. Um, would you like to share your presentation? Yes, sure. So. Uh, Can you see my content, my screen? Not right now, no. Oh, no. How about... Yeah, perfect. How about... Yep. I cannot see. I have problems. Just give me a moment, please. Yeah, take your time. So, can you see... Uh, yeah, we see like, your... Yeah, now it's perfect. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, hello everyone. My name is uh, Puru Dunkiba. I'm originally from Tunisia, so this is uh, really exciting for me to be here and to present. And so, thank you for the uh, invitation. I am teaching at the Qatar University at the uh, program of physical education, and I have been in Qatar since uh, 2013 when I have conducted my uh, study. So today I will be uh, we're talking about the effect of passive and active hypothermia on perception. So as we all know, to, in order to uh, understand the human performance, in order to come up with strategies to improve it, all of us are working together and uh, in different aspects. All of us are particularly uh, interested in diet, sleep management, medical support, psychology, or physical uh, training. And in particular, I am interested in physical training and specifically proprioception because it's an important component of motor control and it's responsible for precise and controlled movements that are essential for a for our daily lifestyle. So it all started with a simple question. How do we send objects around us? How do you, uh, if you 
body awareness in the state. So uh, this question was of very important uh, time, hundreds, more than 100 years ago, until uh, in 1906, the uh, neurophysiologist uh, Sir uh, Charles Trinitan, he introduced the word of perception. And in his classic book called The Integrative Action of the Nervous System, he described the proprioception as the state where the participants or the human, we perceive our positions and our movements in the state, but this awareness comes only from the proprioceptors located in the joints, muscles, and tendons. And he uh, separately uh, distinct, he said that this uh, distinct sensation separates from the five tendons. Um, up until 1966, after 60 years, according to Gibson, ascribing the proprioception only to proprioceptors was the principal fallacy or weaknesses of appearance uh, from the classification. And he said that a person's sensation uh, of his own body and movement not only comes from the proprioceptors, but it, it, only, it uh, also comes from what we can see, hear, and feel. And since then, proprioception was of uh, very paramount importance, and it was uh, assessed by so many disciplines as medicine, and neuroscience, physiotherapy, physiotherapy, etc., each trying to define it through uh, their own context. However, in 2010, all the researchers agree that proprioception might be uh, defined as the ability to integrate sensory information from mechanical receptors to determine body segments and positions in the space. So to explore proprioceptive mechanisms, three techniques were uh, widely used in the literature, but their applicability and ecological validity differ. So as we can see on the left side uh, of the screen, we have the first step is the joint position stance or the joint position reproduction, where the participants, he has to uh, match or to reproduce a predetermined or pre-experienced uh, position. On the right hand side is the threshold of detection of passive movement. As you can see in the picture, the participants, they will be using a blindfold, headphones to cancel any auditory or uh, visual information. And the limb in question tested will be isolated. And the participants, you would have a stop button in his hand and you will stop the movement as uh, as soon as he perceives that his limb is moving and he will report the direction of the movement. However, these two tests, they have limits and they were uh, critics uh, in the literature because they are exploding the proprioceptive uh, ability in an isolation mode. So the limb is isolated, the limb is moved at a very slow movement, uh, and passive movement, and it's uh, isolated, the movement is isolated from uh, any other inputs like auditory and visual, which is not the real situation because when we are moving on our daily uh, movement, functional movements, they are made on a weight-bearing position, on a self-paced uh, velocities, and not in isolation. Also, these tests have only three to five testing trials in the testing. Therefore, we use what we call the AMEDA, which is the Active Movement Extent Discrimination Assessment. So this technique is based on, on aesthetic proprioception under the natural conditions. So we are mimicking the real movement of the athlete or the participant. Uh, so the movement is free on a subspace and in normal weight-bearing condition. And we have 50 trials per test. So as you can see here in the, in the video, so the test is quite simple. Each participant is giving a familiarization session in which he will experience five different uh, movement displacements from one to five, three times. So the familiarization is 15 uh, uh, witnesses of the movement. And then for the real testing, the participants will undertake 50 trials of testing in which the five positions are presented 10 times randomly. So on each test, as you can see here, one movement is allowed in the, in the trial. So the participant will move his life to a stop and he 
he will bring it back as soon as he perceives the movement. And then once he, re he repositions his leg, he will uh, judge and dis try to discriminate and report what was the position he thinks it is. And this will go on for 50 times. So this test has been extensively used in the literature. It has been evidence that this test can uh, detect differences between healthy participants versus injured, uh, athletes uh, versus sedentary, elite athletes versus another athlete. And this test also can be hand, uh, custom made for every joint on our body and with high saccharination uh, coefficient. So when we looked at the literature, we saw that lots of uh, papers or studies were done on the effects of competition level on proprioception, injury on proprioception, training, but we did not find any, uh, uh, any uh, study that explored the effects of heat on proprioception. So let's go back quickly. So proprioception is an integrated process that collects information coming from the uh, proprioceptors located in the uh, muscle and tendon and skin, uh, uh, visual uh, uh, receptors, uh, vestibular organs, and it will, this information will be transmitted and decoded at the, at the level of the central nervous system, and then it will collaborate to uh, a motor uh, action. And this level, this process is modulated at three levels, the spinal reflexes, brainstem, and cognitive process. And surprisingly, these three levels of modulation are affected by uh, hypersthemia. So we saw that the neural drive reaching the muscle is uh, uh, altered uh, with hypersthemia. And this alteration can be evident by the uh, alteration or a decrease at the uh, evoked, electrically evoked age of reflex, and also perturbation at the level of the central nervous system has been evidenced by a decrement at the occurrence of complex cognitive tasks that were done in the heat comparing to control conditions. So taking all together, we were, uh, we were asked how does passive hypersemia impair proprioception and balance? And uh, when we talk about hypersemia, we have to say that it's an increase of the core temperature above the set range specified for normal active humans. This could be set, uh, it's set at 37, around 37 degrees at, the, at breast and about 38 if we talk about uh, moderate exercise. And usually the hypothermia is associated with thermal strain, cardiovascular strain, and receptor strain that would affect the uh, human performance. And as we may know, and we all witness that the climate is changing, the earth is heating, and we are really experiencing severe heat waves these days more than before. And these heat uh, waves are even more intense than before. So we really need to consider this uh, problem, uh, looking that uh, sporting competitions are often scheduled during the summer months in countries with more uh, with warm uh, climate. So looking back at the history, I hope you can see the video. I think that it is. Here are the lines. Why? Please excuse me, technical error. Yes, now I have. So, so again, so looking back at the, the history of the Olympics in 1984, the first women's Olympics uh, in Los Angeles at the hot ambient condition in year 30, Gabriela, what, what you are seeing now, the Swiss uh, athlete Gabriela Anderson. Uh, finished the race with an erotic gait pattern, as you can see, and her core temperature was near 41. And it confirms how devastating the impact of hypertermia on the human body and on the central nervous system. Therefore, understanding the impact of the heat stress on human health and performance is really important. So, if we go back to our first question and our first hypothesis that Passive hypersemia would impair our perception. We would ask the second question: uh, Does exercise 
induced hypothermia would have the same uh, impact. And therefore, we had the second study, and it was about the exercise induced hypothermia on proprioception. So, going on the practical side now, in order to answer our first question, we hypothesized that our hypothesis was nerve alteration induced by the whole body passive hypothermia would really impair active movement based proprioception activity and balance as compared to the normal thermic state. So in our first study, we had 14 participants. They came to the laboratory for three sessions, one familiarization session and two testing sessions. The cool session was at 24 degrees and 40% humidity, and the hot session was at 40 to 50 degrees uh, Celsius uh, heat and 40 to 50 percent of the humidity. So prior, uh, prior to testing and to the entrance to the heat chamber, because the testing was done in a heat chamber or climate chamber, the participants were first prepared with the equipment. So uh, we used, uh, we, uh, how it, we placed the uh, core temperature pill. It's a small pill that the participants would self-insert by themselves in the structure and it will uh, measure the core temperature throughout the whole setting. We use uh, buttons, as you can see, eye buttons here for, for measuring the core, the skin temperature, uh, the uh, heart rate monitor. Uh, we also measure their uh, hydration status before the testing. We make sure that they are hydrated when they enter into the room. And also the, we place the electrodes for the electrical stimulation later on during the testing. So once participants are ready to go in, they will enter the room, as I said, uh, during the cool temperature was 24 degrees and during the hot was 48 to 50. So first participants will rest for a while and then we start the series of testing. So we had a uh, dynamic and uh, static balance testing. So you, we, we use the SEVT result excursion balance test for the dynamic balance, but we use a modified version of it with only the medial, posterior medial, and anterior medial uh, direction. And the test was done in a first place here in the middle. I hope it's clear for you to see for the single leg balance test. In regards to the neuromuscular assessment, we, uh, you, we have some uh, electro uh, stimulation on the tibial nerve and we uh, measured or we collected the evoked, electrically evoked uh, H reflex uh, from the gastro and the solid And we have the uh, that was the active movement discrimination uh, assessment uh, to the apparatus. So during the whole uh, testing session, the tests were randomized in between the yeah, uh, balance in between the uh, uh, subjects, but they were the same for each subject in the two different uh, uh, um, situations. Uh, throughout the whole session, we uh, measured the uh, heart rate, the skin temperature, core temperature. Uh, 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 Comfort, uh, uh, sensation, and thermal comfort. And here, uh, during the hard session, we did not start the testing only when the participants they reach 39 degrees at core temperature. So basically, during the hard uh, trial, participants they do, they stayed in the room in average 55 minutes until they reach 39 degrees. But for the cool, center, for the cool uh, session, after a few minutes, we start the testing. So, our results. So, uh, uh, in line with our uh, our hypothesis, we found that our data uh, presented that we have an increase, a significant increase in the core temperature of our participants, 39 degrees in heart compared to 36. Increase in the skin, the skin temperature, 39 or 37.9 to 32. Heart rate increase, 
uh, thermal sensation, thermal discomfort. So these other data were in line with it. Let's assume that hyperthermia is associated with a thermal strain increase or thermal strain increase of cardiovascular strain and perceptual strain. So in terms of the neuromuscular assessment, uh, uh, as a response to heat uh, exposure or to the fact that heat exposure, age reflects a cure earlier in heart than in control, and consequently with a significant lower altitude. And this observation was mainly explained or uh, could be explained by the faster nervous conduction velocity in the heat compared to the control condition, or by a uh, genetic failure state on the literature and on other studies in our team. Also, as a response to the passive heat exposure, alteration in the ability to discriminate between the movements and, in other words, the uh, uh, alteration or impairment of uh, the uh, proprioception was evidenced by a faster response to the stimuli, which is the movement itself, and this can be attributed to the shortening contraction duration and half relaxation time during the movement. So, as you can see on the left-hand side of the graph, uh, we have the control session and the hard session. So in black, it's the, uh, the time that the participant took from the starting position to the movement. And then the gray bar is the time that they hold, took the time to hold on the position itself. And then the positioning is the time to come back to the starting position. And it was significantly short in heart comparing to the control position. So also alteration in the uh, ability to discriminate was evidenced by an increase, significant increase error while discriminated between the movement in the heart comparing to the control position. In terms of uh, postural stability. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. I'm very sorry to interrupt, but we have like three minutes left. Just for your oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, very short. Okay, so, yeah, I'm, I will try because I didn't even start the second study. I will try to squeeze this in three minutes. Okay? Okay, okay. okay so, let's go quickly. So, in terms of postural stability, I'm not going to include the detail, but yes, we found our results uh, evidence that postural uh, stability, whether it's a dynamic value or static value, was significantly impaired by the exposure to hyperthermia. So, uh, to not go into the details of the technology, any of the mechanical uh, properties of the muscle could be could uh, account for the decrease of the impairment of proprioception and balance that we have shown. So later on, on the later stages, we demonstrated we confirmed that proprioception is uh, impaired by heat, but we wanted to uh, to demonstrate or to determine the applicability of this knowledge in the exercise induced hyperthermia. So going back to our second question, that exercise induced hyperthermia as a perception, we emphasized that our hypothesis was the elevated thermal and physiological strain would impair angel perception. In the second study, we had 12 participants. Again, they came for three sessions, familiarization, and two, I think one at school, 22 degrees, and one at 39. For the um, heart uh, trial, we used, as you can see here in the picture, to increase the room temperature or the area temperature to up to 39. We used nine meters. They were all centered around the, uh, the athlete, and we used a fan in order not to allow the heat to, to dissipate away from the participants. Uh, after, again, uh, equipment equipping the participants with the rectal fields, the, the, the uh, polar watches, and uh, heart rate monitors, and everything, participants they started their testing. So the test was a 30 minute self paced performance run, uh, run and was uh, um, uh, proceeded before and after a proprioception test, which was the same one as the first study, the active woman discrimination assessment. So, along the way, we measured heart rate, the RPE, comfort, uh, uh, thermal comfort, uh, etc. So, our results showed that 
Uh, in line with the first study, we have an increase in the core temperature up to 39, uh, almost 40 increase in the skin, uh, uh, body temperature, heart rate, thermal discomfort, and the RPE. In terms of performance, um, the velocity displayed an interruption effect between time and time exposition as it increased from the first to the second half of the, in, uh, of the ranking pool, as not in half, as you can see here. So during the pool, uh, the pool uh, condition, the velocity increased at the second half, but it was significantly decreased in the, uh, in the half. So the average running velocity was slower during uh, the self space of regular runner in the half compared to the pool as well, which Consequently, affected uh, the uh, total distance um, covered by 55%. And we confirmed that uh, our results show that, again, the uh, exercise induced hypothermia uh, affected the, uh, uh, well, increased the error during the movement discrimination test. So, to, in conclusion, in our data, evidence or our data shows that with the uh, effect of active hypertensia, we have a thermal strain, we have a cardiovascular strain, a perceptual strain, that all of it taken together might affect the proprioception uh, activity in, in our study. So I just want to give you just a simple uh, glance at the other study we did. So we demonstrated that active and passive hypertensia affected proprioception. So we wanted to know if these uh, effect and these alteration would affect the running kinematics. Um, and but this is on a later stage. So the take home message of the, the take home message of our studies is that yes, hypothermia is has detrimental effects on the normal muscular uh, abilities and specifically proprioception. Why this is very important because proprioception plays an important role in the human performance and uh, if uh, poor proprioception presents herself uh, its present, it might not only impair the, uh, the performance but only increase the risk of injury. So our take home message is uh, now we wanted to follow uh, the follow up with investigation to transfer our knowledge from the lab based studies to the field based, uh, field based studies. And if we know that the proprioception would be impaired, so how strategies can we use in order to avoid or to mitigate this effect? Is there any cooling methods? There are many cooling methods actually, but what, which one is the most effective and low cost uh, um, method to help us? And maybe uh, we will just go back and look. So, how can we prepare our athletes or, 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 or ourselves? to uh, do this kind of the heart anti conditions, maybe this activation will protect uh, proprioception deficits following hypothermia. And thank you. So, thank you very much for your presentation and for my thank you. of uh, information about the topic um, on passive and active hypothermia. So, during to the time, we have um, space for one question from the audience. Yes, please. Yes, okay. Sorry? Okay. The chat button, there are questions. Is there a Sorry, I'm not here. Yeah, me neither. Mm -hmm. What have I'm sorry, uh, it's really, there's a lot of noise. There are questions only in the chat box. Okay, so we we'll go to the next. Someone wants to ask a question. Can you hear me? Yes, but we are not. Um, huh? Is there one question? In the online room, I cannot hear it. Maybe you type it in the chat. Okay, so I think um, 
we will continue. And if anybody's having a question, um, you can provide your email and we text you. I think it's yes, best so right now. Because thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very it's much. Really much. Pleasure to thank you. So, and I see Karim Shamari. Sorry if I pronounce your name wrong. Um, you're also in Qatar right now, but uh, from my information, you're from Tunisia as well. So we are very um, pleased to have you here as, uh, at the conference, and you will talk about injury and illness surveillance in professional football, the Aspetar Aspetar experience. So, yes, hello, do you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. I'm going to try to share my, uh, my screen now. Yeah, when you see my screen, can you, tell, can you afford me to see my screen? Yes, yes we see your screen. Um, okay, very good. One is full screen. I'm going to start. So first of all, I would like to uh, thank, very, thank uh, a lot uh, Dr. Hamdi Stuber and all the team for inviting me. And I think that uh, do you, you still see the slide, isn't it? We see the slide, but not in the presentation mode right now. Yes, yes. It's always. And now it should come. Just uh, wait a second. Yeah, it's working. It's working? Yeah, okay. yeah. Very good. So, I'm sorry for these technical issues. So, I'd like to thank Dr. Hamish Shu and all his team for this uh, excellent opportunity of organizing this very nice uh, conference with uh, such quality of, uh, of uh, speakers and uh, I see uh, five thousands of uh, attendants uh, so far so for, for an end of morning uh, time it's very good. Thank you very much for uh, your patience. So I'm going to share with you something I've been working on for five to six years now which is the injury in the surveillance uh, in uh, football. First of all I have no conflict of interest with uh, regard to the content of this uh, presentation. And uh, I would like to attract your attention on a, a short one-page editorial that you wrote with Professor Rose Bauer a few years ago about the relationship between uh, injury and illness surveillance, the risk of injuries, and uh, performance. And we have now more and more papers uh, coming up showing that uh, if you are injured, the performance is affected. And the problem is that uh, if you do not measure anything, you're just uh, having the uh, outstretch uh, tactics or techniques, which is burying your, your head in the sand and waiting for life to uh, just happen. So if somebody gets injured, it happens. And if it's not injured, everything is good. So if you don't want to do the ostrich and, and bury your head in the, uh, in the sand, you could eventually think about the Manmachal uh, model. Uh, let me try to activate my uh, pointer options. So the Van Machenen model is a four-step model where uh, the first step would be to assess how many injuries you have and then to understand the mechanism of the injuries and once you have assessed and understood you try as uh, the first, uh, so, sorry, as the third step to uh, implement in, uh, preventative, preventative measures. And then the fourth step would be to assess if these preventative measures have uh, been efficient or not, and then take the cycle again. Uh, this Van model exists now for many years, and uh, very recently some implementational issues have been uh, investigated. So whatever, uh, well, what about implementing this model in Qatar, in Tunisia, or elsewhere, and uh, in this club or other club, uh, in female, or in, in male, in basketball, in football. So this, this should be a bit different and should be taken into consideration. The, the big chance we have here in Qatar is that uh, from a geographical point of view, Qatar is a small country and most of the, of the, most of the teams sorry, uh, are concentrated in Doha the capital. So in Doha the capital we have more than a dozen of teams. And if you see here on the bottom right section of the uh, slide, this is Qatar as a country. Doha is here in the square, and we have two teams out of uh, Doha, which are uh, al 15, 20 kilometers from uh, Doha. And the, the farthest you would go if you go away from Doha would be 40 kilometers uh, to al -Khur. So you see that here, from an implemented, implemented national uh, perspective, it's relatively easy to do because everybody is very close to each other. In addition to that, 
we have the big, big, big chance of having this, the NSAP, which is the National Sports Medicine Program, which is a, a set of colleagues we have together, work together. There are around more than 300 uh, people who are the medical staff of hospital in the clubs and federations. So all the national teams have a medical staff uh, from hospital. But most importantly, the 17 uh, professional football soccer team have also at least one doctor, at least one physiotherapist, and at least uh, one massage therapist, and some of them have, have even uh, a nurse. So all these medical staffs are working with outside there, with the clubs, and they are paid by the hospital, and they work according to uh, standardized methods set by Aspetal and the NSAP all together, we work together and we decide if we do this uh, this way or the other way. And this is a big, big, big chance. We have very competent doctors there, out there and uh, this allows the very good quality of data that we collect data. So this is very important to notice. This is relatively easy when it's in this unique model in the world because this model of having all the medical staff of staffs of the professional, the, the main professional teams, at least the League One professional teams, uh, being, being uh, employees of only one institution, this is unique in the world. It does not exist any, anywhere else, and this is uh, relatively pity. So, with this, we have started to uh, create a database. We have a first database about the QSL, which is the Qatar Stars League. So, uh, first league in Qatar. Now the data collection has started in 2008, so more than uh, 12 years ago. And uh, on this model, we also have exported our uh, injury and illness surveillance to the continent. And since December 2016, we have met in Kuala Lumpur in the uh, AFC house uh, with the uh, with the managers of the uh, medical committee of the AFC and as we got all together we have invited this uh, set of doctors and some physiotherapists and some managers to start the AFC injury and the surveillance in elite uh, football and this has started with 13 teams in 2017 and then all the teams have uh, have joined so we have teams from far east to far west of uh, of uh, the Asian continent. Uh, next to Qatar, you have, uh, of course, teams from uh, Qatar, from UAE, from Saudi, from Iran. Uh, in the middle of Asia, you have teams from uh, Hong Kong, Thailand. And then in the Far East, you have uh, from the South, uh, Australia to the North, you have also teams from Japan, passing by uh, uh, Bangladesh and the uh, Philippines. So, uh, a quite nice representative way of uh, of having a set of uh, sample of teams from uh, the Asian continent. We have set, of course, uh, a leaflet. If a, if a team is interested to join, we send a leaflet, we start the first contact, and then we have, we have a very detailed leaflet or guideline for the users explaining how to use Excel sheets and how to, uh, to collect the, the data of injury and illness, but also the uh, data of exposure. So, I will, I will enter into a bit more details uh, in a minute, but uh, I would like to tell you that uh, one of the ways to attract the doctors who are participating to, uh, to, the, to the program is to, to tell them that from the moment they join us, they will uh, enter a network, a network of scientists uh, in, uh, in, uh, in football in Asia, and uh, indeed we have uh, uh, group email, uh, WhatsApp email, we exchange articles, we exchange, we exchange uh, uh, information. But of course, it's very important to notice that the data, the data they send us is anonymous. And we at Aspita will never, at the AFC, will never uh, give the data of our club to another club. This is absolutely anonymous. And to uh, reinforce the anonymity, we have set uh, a system where the teams in Asia send the date of injury and illness with a, with a nickname to the players. So they could uh, they could name one of their players Mickey Mouse or whatever. They know who Mickey Mouse is, we don't know. And we know that Mickey Mouse got injured in general, that's it. And uh, joining the program will uh, make the club look very responsible because the agents of the players, the players, the agents of the players and the managers we 
know that henceforth, once the club has joined the club, the, the program, uh, the club has joined uh, a very professional way of uh, of monitoring injuries and things. So, uh, thanks to uh, Professor uh, Jan Exxon, we see Professor Jan Exxon here, in uh, 2019, just before the pandemic started, we have had the chance, uh, I have had the chance to co-lead with Professor uh, Jan Exxon this first international meeting of clubs participating to the UEFA study. We have a study that started more than 20 years ago, and which is managed and led by Professor Jan Exxon. Professor Jan Exxon, to those who study injuries and illness in, uh, in football, he is the leader of injury and illness epidemiology in football. And from my side, uh, I'm leading the AFC study. So we had 17 clubs from Europe in the uh, Juventus, uh, Porto, big, big clubs, PSV and Dover, big clubs, and the clubs from. Uh, from Asia, like Kashima Antlers or Persepolis, uh, Kashima Antlers from Japan, Persepolis, uh, Sepahan, and I don't remember the names, but to tell you that in the AFC, uh, sadly, we also have several teams who won the Champions League, of course, the medical doctor, Dr. Guru, who is the chairperson of the medical uh, committee of the AFC, and we have all the doctors uh, sitting next to each other, one from Europe, Asia, Europe, Asia, Europe, Asia, and so on. It's very interesting in today's uh, workshop. Not only we have discussions, but we have workshops uh, on a dental emergency kids that have been. Uh, Uh, we have a time in hospital, but also the workshop on uh, uh, cadaveric uh, surgery. We have uh, three real uh, joints. Here was the ankle, here was the shoulder, and here was the, uh, the knee. And we have is here uh, Dr. Peter Duch, who is our chief medical officer, and now he is one of the leaders of the surgery, of the anti surgery in the world. And here Dr. Khaled Khalifi, who is also one of the leaders of the world leaders in surgery of the knee. So, and, uh, and here you see uh, the doctors, uh, the team doctors, following with great attention these, uh, these kind of very real data, hands-on uh, workshops. So this is to tell you that uh, the teams who, who decided to participate are not only sending data, but receiving back uh, things like this, event, but more, and I will explain this a bit later on. But now, let's have a, an idea of if you are part of a team and you want to be part of uh, a, sur a surveillance program, you need to understand the data. And to this we have, as I told you, developed these uh, uh, guidelines and we have uh, injury cards where everywhere uh, for any injury you will tick on is it the injury uh, which uh, injured body part, is it the head, the neck, the sternum, the abdomen, etc. Is it uh, to the right or left or bilateral uh, injury, etc. So you fill in an, an injury card was it an injury? What is the onset? Injury mechanisms, etc. And we also have a simple one-page uh, illness card. So with this, we collect data. But what will you do with data? So let's imagine you have two teams. On the left, you have the team A. On the on the right, you have team B. And both have have had in their next season 30 uh, injuries. But the team A had only 4,000 hours of exposure, which is training in matches while team B was training uh, more than team A. So what about the incidence, which is the number of injuries in the denominator divided by the exposure in the denominator. Let's do the calculations. And this gives 7.5 injuries per 1,000 hours for the team A, which is the average, an average uh, in, uh, injury incidence, while the team B had only five injuries per 1,000 hours. Why? Again, I would stress the fact that they have exactly the same number, uh, the same absolute number of injuries. So, ex expressing the injuries uh, uh, with regard to the exposure is very important to understand. There's also an, an, another very important recent, <coughs> sorry, recent uh, measure 
and the way of of following one of your injury illness is the burden. What's the burden? The burden is the number of days lost in the denominator divided by the exposure in the denominator. And here we see that uh, this team had had 35 days lost per 1,000 hours, while this team has 66, 66 days lost per 1,000 hours. So each one, each time the, 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 the whole team trained or played 1,000 hours, on the left they had only 35 days lost, so the players not participating, and on the right 66. So, we provide the, the, the clubs with excellent uh, sheets, so free, it's not software, it's, it's a free uh, file if you have excel on, on your computer, and you, you will be able, by entering the data, you will able, be able to have monthly media reports. Very basic media reports where you have the number of injuries, the number of illness during the month, the exposure rate, and the injury rate per month, and the illness rate per month, and the number of days lost because of injuries, number of days lost because of, of illness, and the availability of the players. So for this team, we see that here they have, in the month of January, they have 89% of the players available. It means that 11% of the players were at the clinic. Uh, the UEFA study, and it's relatively similar in the AFC study, shows that in a professional football team, you have around 85% of the players available and 15% of the players out. Out, just uh, injured, in, in or in rehabilitation. Okay, not fully available for uh, practice. And here, I would like to thank uh, Monta Santaven, our colleague, who is uh, working in the database to uh, come up, we, we work together to come up with very interesting reports. I will show you here three slides. Uh, but these reports are about 30 pages, and uh, the doctors and the physiotherapists who work with us use these uh, reports to try to understand the profile of injuries in the in the class, and then based on this we'll implement or not uh, preventative measures. And here I would like to say that we work with fantastic doctors who with their feedback are enriching us and by enriching us they enrich the literature and I will uh, give uh, two words on this uh, in a minute. So uh, one of the samples of what they get is for example you are uh, the, team X, uh, the team X1 and of course, anonymous of the teams, you will know that uh, the average of the AFC is here, around 10 injuries uh, per 1,000 hours, and if you're here, you're around the average. These three teams have uh, an incidence which is higher than the, uh, the average, and these three or four teams have uh, an, uh, an incidence which is lower than the average. This is only a broad approach to approach to uh, to the compress that you have, also the burden, etc. And this is in the 30 pages uh, of report. Of course, you have other details like, for example, what is your training injury rate, what is your match injury rate, what is your overall injury rate. You see here that you have a peak in April, and then September, October, uh, when the uh, season starts, there are two other peaks. Also, after the, the relative break in December, you have another peak in January. So you can uh, try to see where the problems are and try to prevent uh, prevent preventative measures because if you prevent some injuries you have available players and we go back to the first slide if you have available players you have a better success of the team the last sample of uh, the extract from the report i show you is here uh, we also report on the body parts and here if you can see that this team when you compare uh, the uh, team is uh, in uh, the team uh, value is in blue. So here at the level of hip and growth and at the level of the knee, it's surrounded by a green circle, which means that in this team they have no problem. Uh, and, and the opposite, they have a very low in, uh, injury incidence of these body parts compared to the knee. But this team has a problem at the level of the thigh because they have 33% of their injuries there at the thigh, while why the, the, the AFC average is 26. And they also have more than the double uh, of prevalence, prevalence of uh, ankle injuries uh, than the, the league. The league being uh, 9.6, and they, are, they have a problem of, uh, in, of ankle strain of 23%. Uh, so if ever you were complaining with with your managers that you are, uh, your pitch, your training pitch is really 
uh, very bad. Uh, now you have uh, objective data to show that, that not only I was complaining about the beach quality, but here, here is the outcome. The outcome is that we have more than double than the rest of the league uh, of uh, ankle injuries. After, after that, the doctor will know that if they are doing uh, preventative measures, uh, etc., take this into consideration. Of course, these are only numbers, and the one to decide the one to decide is the doctor with his colleagues to interpret the data according to the situation of the blood. So, when I told you that we are lucky to work with the NSFP doctors here, we learned a lot. So, by our feedback, we convinced the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, to organize a consensus statement. So, this is a consensus statement on the methods for recording and reporting the epidemiology data in injury and illness surveys in sport. And we, were, uh, we, we met all there with these experts from the, the world in Lausanne in 2019. And we published this paper in 2020 in uh, BJSN. And uh, one of the, in here I would like to say that this is Pierre Gouverna, and this is the first author, my director, Rolf Barr, and this is myself, the so last author around uh, Pierre Gouverna, just uh, an eye, nine years of this. This, this uh, figure is the way this consensus statement has given advices to how, on how to collect, but also how to report. And one way of nicely reporting the data is this uh, injury matrix, where on the x-axis you have the incidence, so the frequency of the injuries, and on the y-axis you have the severity, how many days were you left out. And of course, you can understand that if the point is on the bottom left, you have very low frequency, very low severity, this is not a problem. If your injury is here, it is very common, but it's mild. No, no major uh, problem of being out of the, of the field. If you're here on the top, right, or top left, it's very rare, but it is severe. And if your injury is here, it's a big problem, because it's very common and very severe. So here we have uh, published in, I think, last year, 2020 or 2021, I think, uh, this paper in uh, British Journal of Sports Medicine, where we used already the consensus way of expressing data. And you see here that, for example, the thigh is severe, yeah, so is, is frequent for the sudden, sudden onset injuries. The, the, the injuries at the thigh are, are frequent and relatively severe, but the knee is, really, is less frequent but more severe. And these lines here are the isolated lines, isolated within the same uh, with the same burden of, of uh, same burden for the injury. So the thigh is next to this line, whereas the knee is, is next to this line. And you can see here all the other injuries of the sudden onset. The rest of the greater onset are here. And of course, I invite you to open the article. We'll find much more of these uh, very interesting uh, and exciting uh, figures. I would like to finish with some interesting things is that at Aspeta we are also in, uh, in charge of the injury and illness surveillance in Aspire Academy. Aspire really being the big dome next to us at 200 meters I see from my window. And uh, there athletes are trained and they study there to become elite athletes. We have the, the pioneer, the, the world champ of setting this injury and illness surveillance 16 years ago, uh, Dr. Olivier Matern, unfortunately, he left us to go to Scotland. He is now the head physio of a uh, uh, big, big uh, football team there. Uh, I will remember the name. And uh, uh, I don't remember anyway. And, and after Olivier Matern, uh, Eric v, uh, Vic also continued the very nice work of Olivier Matern. So we have very nice uh, publications. And I have an extract here. This is from the uh, study of Eric, uh, Eric Vick. You see the, the categories. So our categories under 13, 14, 15, everybody together, 16, 17. This is the categories of four years. Uh, Olivier Matern had that deeper. Uh, uh, he's working now in Glasgow Rangers, I remember. And Olivier Matern from Glasgow Rangers sent, the, sent us the, the results of his study. I'm, I'm finishing. This is the second last uh, slide, and you can see here, for example, the incidence and the severity of all the categories from under 9, follow me, under 9, under 10, 
and the 11 and the 12. So all these young categories have absolutely no problem of injury. And then we grow up pre, uh, pre-puberty, under 13, under 14, under 15, under 16. And you see that under 16 and under 17 are already jumped on the upper line. And you have even more towards the dangerous uh, zone, the under 18 and under 19. So you have very, very clear and very, and very rich and very important data. And here we have different types of injuries. And this is a glimpse of what's happening here. So this is not important because I told you this is not, this area, this uh, clear yellow is not, not a problem. But here you can see this point and this point. These are completely opposite. Your contusions, a lot of contusions, with almost no day is lost. Because after a contusion you can play the day after most of the time. And the other opposite is the meniscus cartilaginous, the physical fractures, which are very, relatively rare, but result in a very high number of days lost. So this is a glimpse of what you have heard recently. I invite you to read the papers. Of course, I can send them to you. And I would like to finish this by thanking the, the, the whole team, Dr. Wu from AFC, our uh, CEO, Dr. Alguerri, uh, my director, Professor Bar, our ex-CMO, Jan Exan, my co-director, Olaf Schumacher, my uh, closer collaborator, Mathis Sazaben, former CMO, Dr. Giroudi. All these people have, have and are still uh, involved in uh, this program. It's not a regular program, just led by one person working uh, by himself. This is impossible. So I would like to thank you, but I'm finishing by thanking you, thanking the ISEP of the first for this excellent opportunity. Uh, I'm uh, honored to represent Aspetal, and I would like to thank these uh, experts from the IOC for the, what we did uh, during the consensus statement. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope I have a Thank you, Karim. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Uh, and Julie, and uh, to sharing your uh, experience in Qatar. So, uh, I wanted to uh, present you first, but my uh, colleagues so, uh, take the opportunity. So, I remember that Karim is one of the Tunisian leader in research, so in uh, publication talk uh, of himself, so about uh, 400 uh, publications on the line. So, uh, thank you again on behalf of all the organization members to, uh, to participate. I know that you, all have, you haven't enough time, but maybe five minutes so for the audience if you have any question. So, from here, for person who want to work maybe on injury. There's one in the chat. Hmm? I think Ashraf is raising the uh, Okay, Ashraf, so... Uh, 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 okay, we are going to ask you. Uh, okay, yes. uh, nice to meet you, Okay, How are you? How are you? Hello, uh, yeah. So, uh, I have a question regarding the final report. So, when uh, we have, for example, the number of engineering for the lab, is it for the dominant or non dominant, or it is the sum of both of them? So, uh, good question. In the first years, we didn't have this information of dominant and do non dominant lab. But after, uh, when I joined, we added the uh, indices, because indices were not checked, and we added uh, some information including dominant and non dominant. And we have uh, published re recently uh, a paper on uh, the injury incidents in football players comparing dominant and non dominant uh, legs. I think it has been published in Biology of Sport, and I invite you tomorrow morning. I don't know if it will be uh, a joint hall or in one or two hours, but I will attend. Uh, my colleague uh, Piotr Zvizhevsky will uh, speak about the journal of biology of sport history. So in biology of sport we have just published uh, this very nice uh, uh, systematic review and I think it was a meta-analysis, I don't remember, and published last year, 2020 I think, and showing that there, 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 there have been more injuries in the dominant leg than the non-dominant leg, but interestingly this systematic review does not include the data from uh, Qatar. The data from Qatar, we have, uh, if I remember well, uh, eight or nine seasons completed now, and with uh, all our colleagues, Monta Santaben, Raouf Rik, Mokta Shaben, Suhail, Shil, 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 etc., Roldbach, Olaf Shumata, all this team we will work now on uh, publishing this data. So this data will be available to you later on, 
And I don't know if the, uh, the Qatar data will, uh, will join the, this tendency of having more uh, injuries in the in the, the I don't know. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think, I think we have another question from uh, our colleague uh, Yusri Ghul, uh, who raised the uh, interesting question about why you take the number of hours in the, at the X axis, uh, but not uh, maybe training low. Uh, number of hours are not training low. Is it uh, what I heard? Yes. Yes. And is? Yes, 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 training low. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you very much. Very interesting uh, question. Uh, usually, it's much easier to count the number of hours of training than a training load, because you know the training load could be measured in different ways. In Qatar, here we have a very interesting uh, project between Asqatar and Aspire. We call this the wind group, W-I-N, wind like winning. It's W for workload, I-N for injury. And we're working on the data between injury, the data of Asqatar, and the data of workload from Aspire. Uh, I can tell you that it's a full site and Grand Chantier. We are working on it now. We have published already two papers out of this. Others will come. But you don't, not only you have a problem of quality of data when you collect training load, because when you have GPS, or you have ProZone, or you have RPE, uh, you have some missing data, some, uh, some, some issues that you are working on to, to solve. But you also have how do you express the training load? Do uh, the session RPE, the uh, ACW, the uh, acute chronic uh, workload ratio, is it uh, coupled, uncoupled, etc. So uh, I commend you for this question, very interesting. Indeed, training load is much more precise than just uh, hours of training, but, but if you do it, make sure that the quality of your data is good, which is not easy. Okay, Karim, thank you. Uh, I will uh, ask uh, you also uh, a question and, uh, about the status. So, okay, what you are doing is very, very interesting. Of course, uh, in Aspital, a lot of data uh, are published, which maybe will uh, improve our understanding about the, the injury uh, etiology. But do you think that uh, at this stage we still have only uh, numbers in, uh, because we don't have any information about the training, about the content, about the pitch, about the characteristic of the player? Because many, many, many factors are considered a uh, factor that can uh, lead to injury. So, is there any perspective maybe to, to improve the methodology of uh, this project? Thank you, it's very interesting. So uh, I would like to pre apologize because after answering this question I have to go because I have another commitment and, I, and I'm sorry I have to go. So, uh, listen Anis, it's all about us. It's all, Anis and guys, it's all about us. It's all about the time we dedicate to data collection. Already we have the doctors and the physios who are collecting data in addition to their, their treatment and clinical follow-up of their players. And, and I have worked in uh, around a dozen of years in football, and I can tell you that uh, 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 there's a microphone on. I don't know if, if somebody is, has his microphone on and you can mute him or mute her. Uh, there's a lot of uh, backgrounds. So I told you, uh, uh, already working in a team is very much demanding. And when you are a doctor and a physio, and in addition to your very hard work, we just collect data, this is already good. But we cannot also ask you to, add, to, to collect everything. So we need to have... Uh, it's, it's very noisy. Can you stop this noise, please? Because it's really bothering. There's, there's somebody... Who, yes. Very good. I, I suppose you just... Uh, you, you're still here. So, we need people who collect data. And to have people collecting data, you, have to need, you need to have motivated and committed people, which is not the case all the time. Because you can be paid or unpaid. And even if you, can, if you, you, you are paid, what will you collect? Will you collect uh, data on training load and all the quality of the pitch, etc. So, ideally, we have questions in 2020, we have questions that might not be answered in 2015, in 30 years' time, because your question is very interesting, but is on the field, uh, the, the feasibility is a relatively 
complicated. So my last thing is I would strongly encourage you that to read the IOC consensus statement. By the way, it's the longest article ever published in British Journal of Sports Medicine. It's 17 or 18 pages. If you read it, you will already know the uh, actual standards of uh, injury uh, surveillance. And I invite you to find the clubs. Uh, next to you have the club uh, Sportif Saxian, uh, Saxon clubs, uh, uh, SRS, Saxon Army, and others to start a collection, and why not the future will come from uh, Tunisia or elsewhere. But as long as we are just waiting for others to collect and we don't want to use, then it will be slow. And I, I'm, I'm really sorry I have to go, uh, Eddie. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, for, thank you for, uh, for your uh, contribution. Merci beaucoup, un bon plaisir. Donc, bon après-midi. Donc, we we arrive at the end of this first morning session. Please, please, because to respect the other speakers, so we need to be here in 15 minutes. Unfortunately, this is very important for the student. So, the student, this is your future. So, take advantage of every. Uh, speaker of every presentation because you will find it. Uh, their idea, you will find explanation, mechanisms of uh, the, the theory. So if you are in here or outside, so try uh, to follow the, the, the program. Thank you for uh, your patience and for your uh, attention.
there is some problem. Please send me a message via WhatsApp. I sent my WhatsApp number for Shitoru, so then I can check whether I'm online or not. Professor, we will show your presentation in WhatsApp. Okay. I can I can move forward? Yeah, it's okay for us. Yeah, yeah, we see your presentation. Okay, so you can start. My speech is on high-test interval training prescription for combat sport athletes. I'm Emerson Franchini from University of São Paulo. Well, I'm going to talk about the combat sports concerning its relevance, some information about time motion, some other information about uh, energy systems contribution because this is quite important for high-intensity interval training prescription. And I will finish my presentation with high-intensity interval training prescription for combat sports athletes. Combat sports are quite uh, popular when you think about professional boxing. A lot of people are watching these matches. MMA, the same. A lot of people interested in this combat, so uh, this is this, this is a kind of important branch of uh, sports nowadays. And recently, in Tokyo Olympics, uh, around 26 percent of all medals were from combat sports. So, countries interested in being in the top level. The metal tables would need to invest in this sport because a lot of metals are coming from that. When we think about combat sports, they are intermittent in nature, so it's quite important to know the work to restoration in these combat sports. In this table, I'm presenting some information about Olympic combat sports. Uh, as you can see, boxing has a work to rest ratio of 7 to 1 to 18 to 1. Facing is pretty much 1 to 1. Judo is 2 to 1 to 3 to 1. Karate is almost 1 to 1. Wrestling is quite similar to Judo, 3 to 1. And Taekwondo is 2 to 1. So, uh, once we know the work to rest ratio of these sports, we can try to uh, mimic this kind of time motion during the training sessions. And we can also infer something about what's going on in terms of physical abilities in these sports. Um, here we have some other information about no non-Olympic combat sports. As you can see, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, 6 to 1 to 9 to 1. Kickboxing is almost one to one, MMA one to one to one to three, and submission is three to one to nine to one. So all these sports are intermittent. They vary according to their rules and athletes' actions. So uh, different kind of interval training should be addressed to to these athletes because the time motion is quite different. Another important aspect when we think about high-intensity interval training is that high-intensity interval training is pretty good to improve both aerobic and anaerobic systems. So if we know something about the energy systems contrib contributions during these combat sports, we can direct a better training and organize a better, better high-intensity interval training for these athletes. Uh, I will present a series of this kind of information, so I will uh, spend a, a little more time here in, in the first sport, which is boxing. So here we can see the energy system contributions during a, a, box, a typical Olympic boxing match. So as you can see, 86% of the energy expenditure comes from the oxidative system. Uh, around 10% came, came, uh, comes from the ATP-PCR system, 
and only 4% from the glycolytic system. So, the first thing to, to notice here is that this sport is uh, aerobic, uh, is predominantly aerobic, so this is a key element in, in, in boxing, but we need to consider that the scoring actions are mostly supported by these two energy systems, especially by the phosphogen system. Another important uh, information we, we can have from this kind of study is how much the athlete is reaching in terms of their view to peak during the match. And as we can see here, during a typical boxing match, athletes will reach around 97 to 100 percent of their view to peak. So it's quite demanding in terms of their oxidative system. We can also have some information about the energy expenditure, which can be relevant for uh, nutritional interventions. And we need to know something about the metabolic power, which is pretty important for organized training, because we can uh, have a, a pretty good idea concerning how much energy per second the athlete needs to transfer. Here we have the same kind of, of information in judo, so it's also predominantly aerobic. Note, however, that uh, it has a little more ATP PCR than boxing and a little more glycolytic con contribution than boxing. Uh, in terms of the mean VO2 in a four minute match, athletes reach around 77% of VO2 peak. But here, the student was using a psychoergometer, not a treadmill as in boxing. So the demand in terms of uh, aerobic power here is not so high as in boxing. The energy expenditure is lower because it's a single four-minute boat, uh, while in boxes we have three rounds. But the metabolic power is a little higher. When we think about Corare, uh, we have a lower uh, demand in terms of uh, aerobic power, only 55%. It's also uh, uh, predominantly uh, oxidative, and we have uh, a similar kind of contributions in terms of phosphogen and glycolytic system. The metabolic, the energy. Uh, the expenditure is not so high, and although there are uh, a single, uh, single uh, rounds, and the metabolic power is between boxing and judo. And to finish this part of my presentation, uh, I'm going to show something about Taekwondo. Notice here that Taekwondo has a lot of contribution in terms of HBPCR. When you think about the, the three rounds, and uh, it's not so high in terms of uh, oxidative contribution and glycolytic is pretty much uh, low. We don't have any information about the percentage they achieved in terms of their view to peak and this is, did not show this kind of results. And we have here the energy expenditure and the metabolic power. So knowing this kind of information, we can uh, choose better the type of uh, high intensity interval training. Another aspect we need to, to know is related to combat phases. So typically in grappling combat sports as judo and wrestling, we have uh, two main phases, one involving grip disposals and another involve throwing techniques and sometimes uh, groundwork techniques not represented here. So these are, most of the time are spent here and explosive actions are uh, supporting this kind of uh, techniques. When we think about, when we think about uh, striking combat sports as Ferrari and Taekwondo, we have two main phases. One, when the athletes are stepping and they keep the distance between the opponents. So this is pretty much to uh, find an optimal opportunity to attack. 
and the attacks are uh, as well explosive actions with uh, a more uh, contribution, a uh, higher cont contribution of speed than uh, force as in grappling combat sports. The same happens here to boxing, which is also a striking combat sport. So a face uh, with some distance between the opponents and a lot of techniques, but in boxing, uh, they, they try to knock out the opponent or trying to score. They use a lot more of actions than in karate and taekwondo. And in fencing, we have a larger distance between opponents and uh, successive actions to approach the opponent and execute an attack. So this is also important when organizing high-intensity interval training for these athletes. When we think about MMA, we can have uh, several actions. So we can have also the same actions as in striking combat sports or the same actions as in grappling in combat sports. So we need to check uh, the profile of uh, our athletes and the profile of his opponent, his or her opponent, to choose a better approach in terms of uh, emphasizing uh, striking actions or grappling actions. Recently, we uh, conducted a systematic review concerning the effects of high-intensity interval training on only combat sports athletes' performance and psychological adaptation. And we considered uh, articles which investigate uh, training programs lasting between four and 12 weeks, and two to five sections per week. And the intensity was from submaximal, so below VO2 max, to all out. When we gathered the information in these articles, we saw no change in percentage of body fat, and this is due to the fact that most of these articles did not control nutritional uh, energy intake. We also found a lot of increase in VO2 peak during this kind of uh, programs. We also found increases in Wingate as peak power and mean power. However, uh, only two studies used combat sport specific tasks, so the training interventions were not sport specific, which is a uh, huge limitation of the studies, uh, most of the studies conducted up to the uh, 2018 when we finished our search. All other uh, studies used running or cycling as training modes. So this may explain why the others improved a lot in no specific tests because they were training something they were not used to and they were test using tests that normally they do not execute uh, frequently. So we need some more studies uh, using both combat sport specific tests and combat sport specific uh, tests. When you think about high intensity interval training prescriptions, this is a model uh, presented by Boucher Larsen in 2013. So we need to consider intensity uh, of both uh, work and relief the work modality, and as well the duration of work and relief. Uh, I talked a little about the duration of work and relief when I showed the work to rest ratio in combat sports. Here I will present something combat sports are, athletes are using in terms of work modality. I hope you can see the video. This is uh, the Chinese uh, judo athletes using a rowing ergometer to uh, execute uh, high intensity interval training. Here is the double Olympic champion Shohei Ono from Japan. From Japan, he is doing a kind of uh, stair running uh, interval training 
during his preparation. This was conducted during the COVID uh, pandemic in Japan. It's a, another kind of uh, interval training used by French judo athletes. Here, a little more specific as judo has a higher solicitation of upper body, they are doing this kind of interval training using the upper body. Here is Tiji Hine, which who is the, the most uh, important athlete in judo. He's using a uh, sky air to do an interval training using upper body and arms in his high-intense interval training. And here it is not high intensity, but just to show something about the kind of movement that can be used in judo. So I use judo because I'm from judo, but we can think about different uh, combat sports specific reactions to execute the high intensity interval training. The other aspect, uh, aspect to be considered is duration. Uh, when we think about this, we need to consider the work to rest ratio I just presented to you. And when we think about the model uh, reported by Boucher and Morrison, they use a kind of short intervals uh, using the reference of one minute here, long intervals, so above or longer than one minute, repeated sprint training and sprint interval training. So depending on the type of system we should uh, focus or we need to develop in our athletes, we can uh, use a kind of different, kind, different type of interval training. So from one to four here, I will not show in details in details all the, the aspects here, but from one to four short intervals, uh, four adaptations three and four long intervals, for repeated sprint training, four and five, and sprint interval training, uh, it's pretty, pretty good for the, the, the five uh, here, the, the, the aspects present in, in box five. The other aspect to be considered is intensity. So when we think about intensity in high intensity interval training prescription, it's quite important that we have at least three uh, points. One point related to critical velocity or the maximal lactate steady state, so a submaximal index. We need to uh, have something related to aerobic power uh, and aer uh, aerobic power index, such as velocity at VO2 max, represented here. And we need to have something related to the maximum speed the athlete is able to reach. So maximum sprint speed is represented here. So if you have a super maximal index, an aerobic power maximal index here, and an anaerobic uh, index here, we can describe a lot of different uh, high intensity interval training. So short intervals, long intervals, repeated sprint training, and sprint interval training as just presenting the slides and some of the slides before. So typically, uh, short intervals are executed between the, the maximal lactate set state and VO2 max or a little above the intensity corresponding to VO2 max. Uh, uh, short intervals are executed uh, a little above uh, the VO2 max speed or intensity up to 120 to 130. Repeated interval, interval training is pretty much uh, above 120 to 106 percent of uh, the velocity associated to VO2 max, and sprint interval training is a uh, kind of all out uh, interval training. Another aspect quite important during the high test interval training prescription is the anaerobic speed reserve, which is the difference between the maximum sprint speed and the intensity corresponds to VO2 max here. 
uh, recently we uh, demonstrated that when you use the anaerobic speed reserve to normalize the prescription of high-intensity interval exercise intensity, there is a reduction in the variation of the athlete's response. Uh, here we did not use uh, combat sport athletes, we used long distance runners and rugby players. It's not important for my presentation here, but which is important is when we prescribe the high test interval training using the maximum aerobic speed as reference, so 110% here, the athletes execute 15 seconds of uh, activity with 15 seconds of passive. Uh, recover at this uh, intensity. Here we have the time limit and the co coefficient of variation. Note here that it's 45% uh, of variation in the time limit for our different athletes. However, when we prescribe the intensity using the 20% of the anaerobic speed reserve, uh, the co uh, coefficients of variation decreased uh, uh, almost uh, to half, 22%, and using 50% of the anaerobic speed reserve, uh, we de reduced the variation to 21%. So it's easier to predict the time limit when we have the anaerobic speed reserve than when we use a single variable as the maximum aerobic speed. We also demonstrated that there, there was a lower variation in the blood lactate delta when we prescribed using maximum aerobic speed or the anaerobic uh, speed reserve. No, note here the variation from 40% to 20 or 21%. So the physiological response uh, here it's a single physiological uh, response, but it was decreased when the individualization was done using two references, the maximal speed in, uh, sprint speed and the maximal aerobic speed, which is represented here by the anaerobic speed reserve. So how to adapt the high intensity interval training prescription to combat sports? Uh, here we have an article, it's a brief report recently published in the International Journal of Sports Physiology and Performance. Basically, uh, what I did, I considered the references used by Boucher and Larsen. So we have here long intervals, so in terms of, of effort duration, one to three minutes, a 40 intensity, 100 to, uh, 90 to 100% of the intensity for respond to VO2 max. If we are using uh, the passive recover, we, can, we should use less than two minutes of pause to avoid that the oxygen, oxygen consumption decrease uh, a lot during the interval. And this is, is quite important because both long intervals, high intensity interval training, and short intervals, high intensity interval training, are directed to improve the view to mass. So it's quite important to maintain the athletes uh, up above 90% or the maximum time possible, close to uh, his or her maximum oxygen consumption during the training session. When we use active recover, we can uh, use four minutes interval. Um, when we are when we are using active uh, recover, we should use uh, intensity close to forty to six percent of uh, the intensity corresponding to VO2 max to avoid additional fatigue. In terms of series four to ten, the work to rest ratio one to one to four to one. So this can both be used to improve the VO2 max or to combat sports with this kind of uh, work to rest ratio. Here an example using Taekwondo. Taekwondo has not the same work to rest ratio as this, but imagine that you are interested in improving the VO2 peak of your Taekwondo athletes. You are in the press season and you know that these athletes should improve uh, aerobic power. So we can use this kind of test 
this is a technical or specific test to uh, determine, determine, determine uh, view to peak. So we have the frequency of peak peaks uh, at the last stage of the test, uh, 34 peaks per minute, and we have also the frequency of peaks in the heart rate deflection point, which was 19 kicks per minute. So, uh, a good example here is to use the delta 25% to guarantee that the athletes are going to reach their VO2 peak during the high intensity interval training. So, we are using the delta 75%. We consider the values of the intensity correspond to VO2 peak and the values of the intensity of heart deflection point. So if we substitute the values I just present, we are going to find 30 kicks per minute. So we can set one minute at 30 kicks per minute by one minute active recover at 40% of the intensity corresponding to VO2 peak, which was 34, so it represents uh, 12 kicks per minute, uh, and we can set series up to the exhaustion of the athlete. When we go to short intervals, high test uh, interval training, this can be uh, run from 15 to 6 seconds. The intensity is 100 to 120 percent of the intensity corresponding to VO2 max. If we are using passive recover, the interval should be lower and shorter than 15 seconds. And if we are using active recover, 15 to seconds to one minute, 30 to 4 percent of intensity corresponds to VO2 max. The intensity here is lower than during long intervals, high intensity interval training, because the intensity of the, the efforts are higher. So to avoid additional fatigue, we should decrease the active recovery intensity here. Series 10 to 20, a work to respiration 1 to 1 to 2 to 1. Uh, I'm presenting an adaptation using karate. We can adapt the test proposed by Santana for Taekwondo to karate. The main modification is instead of using Bandao Chagi, we should use Mawashikiri. And we can also use the FSKT test uh, to determine, determine uh, the maximum sprint speed. So, uh, the example here, the athlete uh, reached uh, 32 peaks per minute in terms of intensity corresponding to VO2 peak. And the athlete executed 20 kicks uh, in the 10 seconds, which co correspond to 120 kicks per minute to use the same kind of units here. So we can calculate the anaerobic speed reserve here, which is 88 kicks per minute. Just to show you the FSKT, it's a single 10 seconds. The video is going to repeat after the first 10 seconds. Here is a Taekwondo athlete, but we could adapt this to Karate. And determine the number of kicks. So, if we are going to use 20% of the anaerobic speed reserve, we calculate the anaerobic speed reserve times 20%. We reach uh, 18 kicks per minute. So we sum up this to the intense correspond to VO2 max. We reach 15 kicks per minute. So using a, a session with sets of 15 seconds of duration, at 15 kicks per minute is around 20 kicks per set in this duration by 15 uh, seconds of passive recovery up to exhaustion. When we think about uh, running uh, repeat sprint training, the effort duration is 3 to 8 seconds, the intensity is pretty high, 120 to 170 percent of the intensity will respond to VO2 max. The pause duration is longer uh, than, much longer than the four duration, so 20 to 6 seconds. Uh, normally we use passive recover, but if you are using active recover, 
the intense should be low, around 30 to 40 percent of the intense correspond to VO2 max. In terms of series, 10 to 20 percent, and the work to rest ratio here is 1 to 8. Actually, we have one of the few studies uh, published about uh, this kind of protocol in amateur boxers. So they use three rounds of 14 seconds, uh, 14 times three seconds awards in the punching bag by 10 seconds uh, intervals between sets and one minute passive recovery between rounds. They asked the athletes to execute this for four weeks, three times per week. And they found that here in panel A, we have the experimental group. Here in panel B, we have the control group. So both groups uh, trained boxing, but this group here did the protocol I just presented. So when they compared the pre-boss uh, intervention results concerning the punch frequency, Note here that the control group did not change. However, the experimental group increased in each of the, uh, the second and third rounds and the sum of one to three rounds, the frequency of punches uh, used this protocol. So the athletes were able to execute more punches uh, per round, which is quite important in this sport. Additionally, they measure the cumulative punch force in a specific uh, uh, erythrometer. So here we have the control group. No change. No change was observed here. However, for the experimental group, they increased the cumulative punch force after training, uh, and they this was observed in every single round. So. The athletes improved the frequency of punches and they also increased the cumulative punch force. They have also measured the view to peak using an upper bar cycle ergometer. And here we have the view to peak in the experimental group. And this group increased the view to peak, whereas the control group did not change their view to peak. Additionally, the peak power during the incremental test was increased in the experimental group, but did not change the control group. So this kind of repeated sprint training is quite uh, effective for boxing athletes. And to finish the protocols, I'm going to show you something about the sprint interval training. Normally this is executed uh, using 20 to 30 seconds uh, efforts. It's allowed normally reaching near 108% of the intensity per response to VO2 max. The pause duration is 2 to 4 minutes. Uh, athletes can do both passive or active and here the active recovery is more to induce a better feeling of, for the athletes than the passive recover because during this kind of effort a lot of negative feelings uh, happen so the active recover here can uh, improve the feelings of the athletes during this uh, interval. Normally this protocol is executed far to, in, in far to eight series and the work to rest ratio is uh, higher than one to eight. Here we have something that's done in wrestling. Is here the athlete is executing four sets of 30 seconds of all out rows using a, a dummy by three minutes active recovery at 30% of uh, intensity correspond to be to max. Well, you can reach all of this information in this table. So this is a synthesis of what I just uh, talked. I will not uh, repeat this information, but this is uh, to call attention to the fact that this uh, table can be uh, found in the original article and all the details are, are uh, presented.
in this table. We can also include workouts using combat sport specific time motion, but remembering that here I adapt the Boucher Larson uh, protocols to combat sports, but it's quite important to use combat sports specific time motion. And to do this, we need uh, the time motion information, which I presented briefly during my during the beginning of my presentation. And here we have some proposals. This is a, an Australian re researcher. He's considering uh, an example for, for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in five-minute bowls. So here he considers the, the duration of effort, which is near two minutes, the typical rest between these efforts, and the re repetition of these uh, two minutes. So typically in a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu match for uh, purple belts, we have this kind of structure. And when we consider the time of effort, normally we have four uh, periods of effort lasting 25 seconds of low intensity activity and four uh, uh, periods of time of three to five seconds of high intensity activity. So when we consider this kind of study recently published, and, and in this study, they analyzed the energy system contribution and the aerobic system dem demand during this kind of jiu-jitsu specific actions. So we could adapt this kind of uh, actions. So the athlete on the guard is executing a kind of uh, triangle on the partner. And this is long intense according to these author authors. And we can uh, interpret interface these kind of actions with these uh, attacks, the double leg attacks, or the uh, kind of uh, guard transition from the guard to the side of the athletes uh, executed in a fast uh, mode. We also have some uh, proposal for MMA. So when we think uh, 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 about a five minute round, we have typically one to two to one to four work to rest ratio. And when we consider the, the, the actions, so we have two or three periods of one to one minute and 10 seconds of activity and two to three sets of eight to 10 seconds of reaction or pause. So we can subdivide the activity in stand sequence, low, uh, high intensity uh, stand sequence, short duration ones, three to four sets, four to five sets of 15 to 18 seconds of stand sequence, but here in low intensity. And we also have high intensity actions during the ground work and typically three, uh, three second sequences of 8 to 14 seconds, or interpassed by 2 to 5 sets of 20 to 36 seconds of groundward sequence using long intensity uh, actions. Recently, we tried to demonstrate why the anaerobic speed reserve is important for combat sport athletes. So we have 28 athletes. We subdivided this group in a low uh, anaerobic speed reserve group and a high anaerobic speed reserve group. We removed the, the athletes close to the median for this group. So here we have 24 from the 28 athletes. When we consider the Uchikome Riffis technique repetition in judo using this kind of uh, protocol, 12 sets of 20 seconds efforts by 10 seconds intervals and the 20 seconds uh, efforts are all out uh, actions. Here we have the maximum number of repetition. So this was done in 5 seconds. We can see that the, the groups are different on certain this. 
We have the mean repetitions per set, the high anaerobic speed reserve is equal to more repetitions. When we consider the speed in percentage of maximum aerobic speed, which was tested uh, before this kind of protocol, we also found that this group achieved a higher percentage of their maximum aerobic speed during the interval uh, session. When we consider the speed in terms of maximum sprint speed, uh, this group had a lower value compared to the low anaerobic speed reserve. And when we consider, and this is quite important, when we consider the speed achieved during the, this protocol uh, regarding the percentage of uh, anaerobic speed reserve, both group, groups set the same percentage, so no difference here. All the other parameters were different, but when we consider the anaerobic speed reserve, both groups uh, set this percentage as their uh, value. So it seems that this can be a pretty good uh, kind of monitoring tool for intensity in this kind of high test interval training session. Here we, we have the repetitions per set. So we'll note the difference between the, the high anaerobic speed reserve group and the low anaerobic speed reserve group. group. Here the percentage of maximum aerobic speed. Note, note the difference between the two groups. Here the same regarding the percentage of maximum sprint speed. The difference is still uh, significant. However, when we present this in terms of percentage of anaerobic speed reserve, no differences, no, no, differences, no differences was found between the groups, only a difference along the, the sets. So this indicates that the athletes set for this kind, uh, similar percentage of their own anaerobic speed reserve. So this variable can be used to individualize high intense interval training in this kind of sport. So my final considerations are uh, that high intense interval training should be chosen based on the combat sport athlete characteristics. So it's important to conduct, conduct uh, the proper evaluation of the athletes and the capacity which we are going to develop. So what kind of physical ability we are interested in with this high test interval training. Typically two additional sessions per week to the regular training system of the athletes are enough to provide benefits. There is no need for more than four additional sessions per week to achieve the potential benefits. Specific testing and prescriptions uh, and prescription uh, is uh, are quite important aspects performance and improvement in these athletes. And time motion analysis is an important uh, tool to individualize high intensity interval training prescription. So that's my presentation. Thank you for your attention. I think we have some time for questions. Thank you, Dr. Francini, for the... Uh... You can and still hear me? Yeah. 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 Uh, Dr. Francini, why do you think me?
Yes, I, I'm, I'm listening to you. Okay. It's not quite clear, but I, I'm listening. Uh, the, there is some sound on, on the background. Thank you very much for uh, this nice and uh, interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you. We will now uh, for the discussion. Does uh, anyone have a question about this presentation? Yeah. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Could you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah thank, yes. you. thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. It was amazing and Please, uh, very detailed. There is someone with the microphone open speaking. So, uh, Dr. Francini, my question is very simple. We have data that are very short sprints, okay? are better for long-term adaptations because of the lower metabolic fatigue, because this means uh, a lower interference effect when mixing different contents in the training. What is your opinion about this evidence when applied to combat sports? Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for your, your question. I think this is quite important. Uh, to consider this aspect, but we also need to consider the type of uh, combat sport. For example, this that you just said, I think it's more relevant for striking combat sports because the, the, the type of uh, interval or the intermittent nature of these combat sports varies for uh, when you consider grappling combat sports we normally will need some of this metabolic uh, stress provided by a longer uh, high-intensity interval training stimulus. So we need to consider the combat sport, the phase of the training season, and as well the aspect that it needs to, to develop. But I agree that we, if we could achieve a similar type of adaptation with lower stress, it's quite important, especially for these athletes, because they, they are training a lot, and as, a, as the nature of combat sports is uh, related to the, to the opponents, normally the injury rate is quite high in this uh, in these sports, so this can be a relevant uh, approach, especially to avoid the concurrence, concurrence, uh, concurrence effect that may be, may take place when trying to uh, direct a lot of different or develop a lot of different physical abilities. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Daniel, for, for this question. Uh, I have a question for uh, Dr. Fragi. Um, although there is a great uh, participation of um, oxidative metabolism in uh, combat sports, I think that athletes during competition need to repeat the intensive, uh, intensive effort during the whole uh, competition. So do you think that uh, you can implement also repeated speedability for this athlete. I mean, uh, maybe it's more appropriate to implement uh, repeated speedability than uh, high intensity and training for this athlete. Yeah, uh, actually, when we think about uh, the actions that are determ determining the scoring, they are mainly repeated sprint uh, uh, actions. So it's quite important to consider that. Uh, however, for some combat sports, they will need uh, a high level of VO2 peak 
not as endurance, endurance runners, but they, they need some aerobic power development because uh, this, this kind of uh, development can provide them a faster PCR uh, restoration as well as a proper recovery between matches. But uh, actually, it's quite important in terms of uh, prioritizing repeated uh, uh, sprint training using specific actions is more important, especially for striking combat sports. And then we need to move to aerobic power because this can be relevant uh, to provide a fast a faster recovery between high intensity actions and as well as a faster recovery or, or a better recovery between matches during a, a competition, uh, especially for athletes competing in sports where they have five to seven matches in a single day. Okay, thank you. Um, my second question is from a particular view. When you organize a training session for uh, those athletes, it's more appropriate to refer to their uh, maximum aerobic speed or uh, anaerobic speed, is that? Do not find a significant effect on injury incidents. And that was in the first study, and in the second study as well, found, found the same, same problem. It didn't alter the injury incidence. The problem, though, is what kind of injuries? All cause injuries. So if you broke your ankle, if you had a concussion, if you uh, tore your ACL, these were all, all combined in this all-cause injury. So if you're running in a field and your foot goes into a, a gopher hole and you break your ankle, do you really think that stretching would have stopped that? So what about other types of injuries? Next slide, please. What has been found is that <coughs> stretching, uh, static stretching, does seem to decrease the effect of musculotendinous injuries, okay? Muscle and tendons. So Woods found that uh, there was a decreased incidence. Uh, McKay, in another study, looked at a, a, a huge basketball tournament and found that basketball players who did not stretch prior to the game had about two and a half times more likelihood of getting injured. Next slide, please. In our 2016 review, we found that there's eight studies that showed injury reduction, again, musculotendinous, and only four studies that did not. And so we indicated that you should do about five minutes or more of, stre of uh, stretching before your, um, your event. Now, you're going to say to yourself, well, you just told me I shouldn't do more than 60 seconds. But what I actually told you is you shouldn't do more than 60 seconds per muscle group. So, of course, you have more than five muscles. So you're going to do 60 seconds for your quadriceps, 60 seconds hamstrings, calves, shoulders, lower back. There you go, five minutes. That should decrease, uh, on average, the muscular tendons injuries. And that's been, been reported by others as well. Then you can ask, well, why does that occur? Well, what we do know from your basic exercise physiology or muscle physiology is that your muscle is strongest when it's at its optimal length as you can see in the, uh, in the figure on the right. And that's because you have the most cross bridges attached, so it's very strong at the optimal length. But when you have a muscle that is stretched to a longer length, you can see that the cross bridges, there's fewer cross bridges at longer lengths. And therefore, you have less force. So where do injuries normally occur? Well, it's normally when your muscle is at longer length. Static stretching allows you to develop more force at longer lengths, and therefore that would decrease the chance that you're getting injured because you've got a stronger muscle at your typically weaker uh, position. Next slide. So, as I mentioned before, if you're a Cadillac or a BMW or, or a Mercedes, you want a compliant suspension. And so a more compliant muscle tendon unit has a greater capacity to absorb these higher tensile forces and and have them accepted or absorbed over a longer period of time. And so therefore, there'd be less force and torque on that tendon or muscle, and we can absorb those forces better. Next slide, please. The problem is, is that we still need very strong 
connective tissue and muscles. So Aaron Katsas, a very renowned researcher from Berlin, originally from, from Greece, he says that if you have excessive elasticity, too much compliance, then they can have some tendon impairments, tendon injuries. So the um, analogy I like to make is that you can have strong and fairly stiff tendons, but you can still have compliance of the whole system. And what I'd like to do is compare that to the suspension of a big truck. All right? So take a look at that figure on the bottom. Each one of those springs, they're called leaf springs, is made of steel or aluminum or whatever. You try and bend one of those, you couldn't bend one of those. Very, very strong. But you notice that there are like about 10 or 12 of them placed together. And so with 10 or 12 of them together, they can move together, all right, and slide together. And that's what we want to happen uh, with our bodies. We want strong muscles, we want strong tendons, but we need to have them slide across. And so we don't need or we don't want cross linkages occurring. And so if we can have those muscle fascicles be able to move across each other, then we can have a greater range of motion, we can have more compliance, and yet we can have strong tendons. And that's the best of both worlds. And therefore, with active um, contractions, we can have strength and, and yet have this, this, this increased compliance. Next slide, please. So what about the effects of stretching on pain? Well, there's only two studies that have looked at um, uh, acute stretching on pain. Both of them showed a decrease in pain, whether it was for the anterior knee pain by the Lenza, or in the case of uh, neck. Uh, neck pain with nurses was the linen wag. They both showed uh, decreases in pain. But of course, two studies is not a, an exhaustive uh, review of the literature, and there's not a lot in the literature on acute effects of stretching on pain. Next slide, please. Why would that occur? Well, uh, unfortunately, it seems my, on the left side, my little cartoon or figure didn't show up properly, but it could be due to the gait control theory of pain. So the gait control theory of pain, you know, if you uh, uh, hurt your fingers, what's the first thing you do? You would grab it and you'd rub it, right? And by rubbing it, you'd be activating some of your type 1 and type 2 fibers, afferent fibers. Those travel up to the spinal cord faster than the pain receptors and the pain fibers. And so the theory is, is that those fast-traveling fibers would block the pain fibers. That theory isn't as, as uh, favorable now, but you can also get the gate control from the descending. So the, those pain signals do get up to the brain, some of them, and then the brain would send down an inhibitory signals to inhibit those signals from coming up. So the interference of the afferents and the, and the inhibition of the supraspinal contributes to a decrease in pain. Another um, theory uh, or mechanism is the diffuse noxious inhibitory control. And in this case, again, we have uh, some sort of insult to the body. The pain receptor sends the signals up. It goes to a reticular formation, and a reticular formation in your midbrain will send down uh, different monal amines, uh, such as uh, endorphins and caffeines, and they act like morphine and would give you an analgesic effect and decrease pain throughout the body. So both of those uh, mechanisms are possible when we uh, stretch and see a decrease in pain. Next slide, please. Another possibility uh, are myofascial meridians. So uh, a number of people uh, purport that when you stretch the uh, myofascia, of course the myofascia connects all the muscles throughout the body. And therefore, if you have a stiffness in one area, it may cause stiffness in another area, and that could cause some pain. So by making sure that there's compliance in the myofascia in one area will cause a, a decrease in stiffness in another area, contributing to a decrease in pain. Next slide. Now what about chronic stretching? So if we stretch for weeks or months, well, here we've got very good evidence that there's decreases in pain, whether it's at your neck, shoulder, chest, lower back, knee. There's a few studies, of course, that you know, science is never unanimous, but for the most part, the bulk of the literature does show that uh, chronic stretching can reduce pain, and, and that, of course, again, could be related to the myofascial meridians, could be related to the local increase in compliance, 
could be low, related to an increased pain tolerance. There's a number of different mechanisms at play with this. Next slide, please. The really interesting thing that we found in our lab and other labs as well is that stretching is global. So if we stretch uh, my right shoulder, my left shoulder becomes more flexible. A study by Dr. Shirochi where we stretched um, the right hamstrings, the left hamstrings became more flexible. So we did a bit of analysis just uh, this uh, past year, taking a look at the stretching effects on the range of motion uh, on non-local. So stretch one muscle, which is the local muscle, what happens to other muscles that were not stretched? Next slide, please. So what we find, you take a look at the sports plot, and you see that the standard mean difference, which is similar to an effect size, was 0 0.86. Remember 0 0.8, because 0 0.8 means a large difference. So 0 0.86 means there's a large increase in range of motion in the muscles that weren't even stretched. Didn't even have to stretch it, just stretch the other side, the other side would become more flexible. Next slide, please. So then we started looking at different moderating variables. Well, is there a difference if you're a trained person or an untrained person? Well, again, look at the untrained people, 0.79. It's almost large. It's as close to large as you can get compared to trained who are 1.14. So both trained and untrained had large increases in range of motion of the non-stretched muscle. Next slide, please. What about if we do uh, stretching to the point of discomfort, the maximum intensity, or we do it you know, close to, um, to a point of discomfort, but not maximum discomfort? And again, in both cases, large increases in range of motion. Next slide. What about the duration? Well, if you do less than two minutes of stretching overall, then it seems that you get a moderate, 0.72, a moderate increase in range of motion on a non-local muscle. But if you do more than two minutes of stretching, then again, it's a large increase in a muscle that's not even been stretched. Next slide, please. And is there sex differences? Well, there's not a lot of studies that just look at females, but we have a number of studies that have combined uh, both males and females. And again, if you combine both, both males and females, the uh, effect size or standard mean difference is 0.79, so it's almost large compared to males only, where it's 1.1, which again is a large magnitude difference. So no matter how we try to split things up, it's always an almost large or definitely large increase in range of motion on the non-local or contralateral muscle. Next slide. All right. So the summary is moderate to large magnitude improvements. It's not modified by the trained state, the sex, or the intensity. Um, when you have longer, more than two minutes of stretching, you get greater contralateral range of motion improvements. And this is good for rehab, because if you've injured a, a leg or an arm and you can't uh, stretch it, you can stretch the other side, and there will be benefits for that, uh, that injured uh, limb on the contralateral side. Uh, next slide, please. So, we had talked before about performance impairments, and I talked for quite a while about how if you don't have a full warm-up uh, and you do more than 60 seconds, you may get important performance impairments. Can you get performance impairments in a muscle that hasn't even been stretched? So we found six studies. We did find that there was a small magnitude impairment on a muscle that was not stretched, typically on the contralateral side. There's a problem with this, though, if we go to the next slide. <clears throat> you notice in this graph, we see contralateral and ipsilateral, so the contralateral muscle, you see one point, like I said, there's only about four or six studies, one point is much greater impairment than all the rest. Same thing on the ipsilateral, and this is the same study, they found much greater impairments. You take those two points out, and it's it's unlikely we would have found a significant uh, or a, uh, uh, even a small magnitude. We probably would have been trivial. But keeping those in, we have to say, based on, on these studies, there's a small magnitude impairment on the other side. But again, there is no full warm up, there's no dynamic uh, activities. This is just static stretching on its own. And I told you about the problem with that. All right, next slide. So, uh, 
This study was not on stretching, but I think it gives us a good indication of uh, what could happen with stretching, uh, and we're using foam rolling. So we go to the next slide. What we did in this study was that we had a massage therapist, and she identified these trigger points or pain points in the calf muscles of our subjects. And then we had, uh, of course, pre-tests. We had five different conditions, which I'll talk about in the next slide. And then we tested people for the pain pressure threshold uh, for up to 15 minutes after the, uh, the interventions. Next slide, please. So the interventions were we either roll the calf, where we identify those, those pain uh, points or trigger points. We roll the contralateral calf, or we massage the calf, where we found the uh, uh, trigger points. Or we did a sham, and we just very lightly rolled over it, where it had no effect, or shouldn't have any effect. And then we had a control. So we did three rolls of 30 seconds each by, by one minute of rest. Go to the next slide, we see the results. So TC is the tender calf. So we rolled the tender calf, the one with the trigger points, and the pain pressure threshold increased. That means they could handle more pain. They were less sensitive to pain. If you look at the MM, the MM is the manual massage. So that's where we massage the pain, the, the calf that was in pain. Again, there's an increase in pain pressure threshold. But the really interesting thing was the CC. That's the contralateral calf. So we, we rolled the opposite calf and then tested the original calf. And the pain calf, which was not rolled, had an increase in pain pressure threshold. So you didn't even have to touch that calf, and you had a decrease in sensitivity of pain. So I would suggest that, that is, uh, you find that in uh, stretching as well. All right, next slide. So in summary, what we find is that, of course, static stretching increases range of motion, about four to five degrees in the ankle, more like uh, up to 12 degrees in the, uh, in the hip flexion and hamstrings. You should be doing 60 seconds or less of uh, static stretching per muscle group within a full warm up to make sure that you don't get performance impairments. Static stretching can reduce muscle tenderness unit injuries. Chronic stretching reduces pain. And these effects are global, they happen throughout the body. Next slide. So I'd just like to thank you for your attention. I want to apologize again for the problems that we had, uh, but hopefully we, uh, we got through this well. If you want more information, I have a book out on the science and physiology of flexibility and stretching. You can get that at Rutledge Publishers, or you can probably find it on Amazon. Um, also, I have a book, uh, chapter in a book on fascia, if you want to uh, find out more about the fascia and foam rolling. And I'd just like to thank everyone for being here, and of course, thank my grad students and colleagues, and of course, my special friend, Dr. Chirauti, for all the work we've done together. Thank you, David, for this great presentation. Uh, I think uh, especially stretching was a long time underestimated training method. Therefore, I enjoyed this presentation very much. And I think all of you are aware that uh, body posture, for instance, started already in childhood to be bad uh, in in children, and I think one reason is the missing stretching. What you would recommend, especially for the school, uh, a stretching method and duration of stretching, maybe for the uh, physical activity uh, in schools. Yes, absolutely. You know, we always think that children are so flexible. And, and there is evidence out there that, uh, of course, very young children are flexible, but even by the age of of 12 years old, yeah. they're starting to lose their flexibility and the range of motion. And then, of course, when they go through the rapid um, growth period, then again, their uh, the range of motion is inhibited, and they're more likely to, uh, to get injured. So it's very important that uh, children uh, um, participate in regular stretching as well. And just like an adult, of course, the, the, the muscles in a child are, are just a smaller version for the most part of, the, of an adult. Um, they should be doing a, a part of their warm-up stack in dynamic stretching. We always want dynamic stretching. I know I've emphasized static because that's a controversial type of stretching. 
but we want to make sure that we get dynamic stretching in there because as I showed, dynamic stretching does include range of motion. And um, of course, with children, it's hard to keep them uh, still. So it's harder to keep them, I would say, to do you know, prolonged static stretching. But I would recommend some static stretching, but with an emphasis on dynamic stretching in children. And you know, that should be in their, in their physical education classes uh, most every day. Thank you very much. There are other questions from the audience? Hi, I'm Daniel. Hi, David. Hello. Uh, I have a question. Uh, thank you for the presentation, excellent presentation. Uh, what do you suggest about the type of ballistic stretching? Those kind of uh, stretching at high velocity and high, and high volume for performance, for enhancement of performance? Yes, that's a, that's a great question because ballistic stretching on its own, of course, uh, can put a lot of stress in the muscle and then obviously if you have a cold muscle, you don't want to be uh, moving uh, the muscle that rapidly under, under cold conditions. So once again, we need to have a good aerobic warm-up. We need to start off with a, uh, a small amount of static stretching. The ballistic stretching should be the, you know, some of the last uh, part of the uh, stretching program that you uh, that you want to do, and so uh, the different and often people ask, you know, what's the difference between dynamic stretching and ballistic stretching? Well, dynamic stretching is normally going through a full range of motion under control. That's the important thing, under control. So dynamic stretching, we're going to be under control. We're not going to put that kind of stress on the muscle that we're going to injure, but we are going to uh, increase um, the reflexivity. The, um, and by using active contractions, we increase the muscle temperature. Once we've got the increased compliance from a, a, a bit of static stretching and dynamic stretching, then we throw in the ballistic stretching. Because then with the ballistic stretching, again, now um, we, we, we can get those, uh, those higher reflex actions and perhaps uh, increase those persistent inward currents that I mentioned before, and able to lower the threshold. So yes, ballistic stretching can be included, but it should be towards the end of the warm-up. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you again. Uh, now I think we have to finish and we have to switch over to the next presentation because we are under time pressure. And uh, the next presenter will be Rodrigo Ramirez Cambio. So we have to switch. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, David. So, moving now uh, to the next presentation uh, with uh, Dr. Rodrigo Ramirez Capillo. Dr. Rodrigo.
I'm going to share with you my, my presentation now. Um, That's good. Presentation? Yeah. Perfect. Um, well, um, thank you for the invitation. Um, the presentation um, is entitled Polymetric Jump Training from Ancient Greek Olympics to Planetary Exploration. Um, currently, I am working at the University Andres Bello here in Chile. Sorry, I, I have a, a little of background sound. Do you hear me well? Yeah. Okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, before I um, start the, the formal presentation, I want to thank you, all the, the colleagues, that have uh, helped me uh, through my research career. Um, several of these uh, colleagues uh, are uh, today in, the, in this Congress. So if they are hearing me, I want to thank you very much uh, for the, the support, uh, for uh, have guided me. Uh, so uh, without their help, uh, probably most of the research projects that we have completed through these years have not been possible. As uh, Isaac Newton wrote to Robert Cook some years ago, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. So thank you to all these giants. I want to start the presentation uh, with um, uh, maybe we can say a philosophical question regarding why we as a human species uh, jump. So uh, probably there are several uh, potential uh, reasons uh, for performing to perform a jump. Uh, for example, uh, when we, we have uh, a moment of joy, uh, we can jump to celebrate this, this moment. Uh, of course, uh, there are some uh, cultures uh, where the, the jumps are a part of their uh, folkloric dances. Uh, we maybe need to jump uh, from one place to another uh, or maybe to avoid some uh, kind of danger. Of course, uh, the jumping actions are very common in, type, uh, in, in different types of games, uh, particularly for youth population. Uh, and uh, in recent years, uh, I want to, to uh, uh, point this uh, uh, social aspect that uh, occurred here in Chile, uh, particularly on October 6th uh, in 2019. Uh, that, that day, the, um, uh, the cost of the subway, uh, the, the ticket for, for taking the, the subway, uh, was increased by uh, the government and the population, particularly the uh, high school students, and the university students were uh, uh, very angry uh, with the government for the increase in the, in the amount of money they had to spend in the subway ticket here in Santiago de Chile. So as a protest mode, 
they started to jump uh, the, the collecting uh, uh, machine where the, the money is, uh, is collected, right? Uh, so they jumped this, uh, this machine uh, and they took the, the, the subway uh, without paying the, the ticket. And this uh, uh, protest uh, in, in, in a jump fashion started uh, a movement, a social movement that uh, lasted, uh, well, probably you hear about this in the, in the news, and uh, ended with a new constitution in, in Chile. With, with the previous uh, constitution was elaborated uh, in the military government uh, of Augusto Pinochet, and so now we're going to have a new constitution here in Chile, and all this started uh, because uh, a jump. So uh, jumping is not only a powerful training method, uh, the, the, the positive effects uh, of the jump training on male older adults' maximal strength. So also is an, interest, an interesting approach for, um, for dinapenia related problems. And also we have several studies regarding the potential of the metric jump training. Uh, for the treatment or prevention of uh, diabetes or glucose alteration metabolism. Uh, in these studies, uh, uh, the, the, the authors found a reduction in the uh, or an improvement in the glucose insulin uh, metabolism, uh, particularly with the use of some uh, jump training exercise, such as jump rope exercise. And relatedly, uh, we recently finished uh, a meta-analysis regarding the effects of John Rock training. And we found these results are not published yet, uh, but uh, we, we hope that the, the reviewers uh, will have a, a positive uh, view on these results. Um, in this uh, meta-analysis, we found that a jump rope training can reduce the body mass index and the body fat of the participants when compared to a control group, even uh, when compared to active control groups. So for the uh, problems related to overweight, uh, maybe some modes of uh, limited jump training, such as uh, jump rope, can be a, 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 an interesting training approach. We have uh, evidence also regarding the potential for limited jump training in cerebral palsy. Uh, pro probably the first study was uh, one from Johnson et al. And in recent years, we have several studies from El Nagar and his group. And uh, very recently, the last month, um, in November, uh, a stop review regarding the effects of power training on cerebral palsy was published. Uh, it's a very interesting study. So uh, this is also a, an interesting field uh, for, for the implementation of geometric jam training. Uh, there are uh, other studies with other health-related uh, uh, population. Uh, such as uh, leukemia patients, uh, Down syndrome, and other participants with special conditions. Uh, so what, what, what is new? Also, uh, the, the application of the meta-analytical technique um, is uh, a new approach to, uh, to analyze the effects of geometric jump training. Probably the first meta-analysis was published by Dr. Markovi, and um, in recent years, particularly from uh, 2010 uh, until today, the number of studies uh, have increased exponentially. Um, about 20 uh, times uh, have increased the rate of publication per year. So this in important increase in the number of published studies um, probably it's difficult to, to, to manage for, for, more, for most practitioners and the meta-analytical studies 
can help to aggregate the, 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 um, uh, to group these studies and provide some uh, robust uh, evidence for the practitioner. And what need to be done? Well, uh, we published a uh, uh, stopping review um, some years ago uh, in the sport medicine where we found some uh, methodological limitations in the metric jump training literature and we provided some recommendations for um, future studies. Uh, but, but basically, what, uh, what needs to improve in this field, uh, in the metric jump training field, is um, the description and the reporting of the uh, relevant uh, training programming factors, for example, the type of surface, the technique used for, uh, for the exercise that uh, are implemented in the training program. Uh, we also need to improve the methodological quality of the studies. Uh, we need more randomized controlled trials. We need to improve the number uh, and the quality of the studies that, um, uh, that, that, that um, in some uh, particular groups, for example, in those female athletes, uh, in older athletes, and we uh, still uh, need more information regarding the optimization of the metric jump training to be uh, implemented in several groups of participants. We um, Currently, we do not know how the intensity should be managed for, um, for different groups um, of participants, the same with the number of repetition, uh, repetitions, for it, sorry. Uh, so we need to improve um, the research um, regarding the optimization of this training method for several groups of participants. And uh, from my view, from my perspective, I think that we need more international collaboration in this field. Uh, probably in your countries, uh, is, um, the, the situation is similar to my country here in Chile. Uh, we have uh, difficulties to obtain um, research grants in uh, sports-related research. Uh, and the grant, um, if we, we, we have the opportunity to obtain a grant, usually the, the money, the, the resources that can be um, acquired are uh, reduced compared with those that are available in the health field. So uh, maybe with an international collaboration, we can solve uh, some of the problems related with uh, insufficient uh, funds to research in a sport related areas. And um, currently, I am working in a living systematic review. At the moment, um, I have uh, more than 11,000 articles reviewed. And from this, I have more than 800 articles included in the living systematic review regarding the effects of the metric jump training, of course. Uh, these uh, studies, these articles, have been uh, described with 32 descriptors, uh, for example, the, the age of the participant, the sport of the participants, and this um, uh, provided more than uh, 20,000 data points. And with this database, uh, I have the intention to um, collaborate with international researchers uh, in the field of the metric jump training, similar to those. Um, uh, studies such as the uh, United Kingdom Bio Bank or, or the Chilean National Health Survey that uh, help uh, uh, international collaboration between researchers. So um, I want to invite uh, all of you that may be interested in uh, performing some research uh, regarding the metric camp training. Um, I have this database that we can probably uh, work together. So uh, I want to thank you uh, for your uh, kind attention. I want to thank you. Uh, I, want to, um, I, I want to thank you for the collaboration for, from all my uh, co-authors. And uh, if you have uh, any question, 
you can contact me at uh, the email that you see on the screen or through my research gate uh, profile. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cabrillo, for this nice presentation. As we see, employment training is uh, have many uh, positive effects, uh, not only for athletes, but also for other population like uh, on the right subject. So I have two questions for you. Uh, the first question is, when you use uh, geometric training in children, have uh, geometric training any impact on uh, their bone growth? Dr. Cabello. Oxygen uptake kinetics. 
which obviously improves performance. At the same time, we have other strategies, which include post-activation potentiation. We will see thereafter some of these strategies. And because of the time we can uh, wait between the warm-up and the main part of the training session, or because we are in a competition, we need to maintain the elevated body temperature. So it is important, it's interesting to have some facilities, maintenance techniques, to maintain the benefits of uh, increased body temperature. So the main uh, effect of body temperature is, as we said, the increase in the rate of anaerobic ATP supply and also the aerobic ATP supply. Basically, this effect, we can estimate that uh, we have, in, in the case of mechanical power, an increase of about 2-3% of mechanical power for every degree of increase in body temperature. Okay? This uh, metabolic increment is mainly there because of the enzyme activity, as we know uh, from basic physiology, physiology, that we have an optimum temperature to increase the rate of reaction of enzymes so we can obtain more energy per second with an increased body temperature. Additionally, other physiological benefits include uh, the, the greatest uh, dissociation rate of the oxymotoly, so this means more oxygen to the working muscle. At the same time, an increased muscle temperature will increase our capacity for torque production and the velocity when producing uh, muscular work, okay, mainly because of the increase of the um, transmission of the electrical impulse in the, in the muscle and also because of the reduced viscosity of the muscle. And finally, we should remember that when after a warm up, a short warm up, and it's important to know that only five minutes of uh, so maximum aerobic exercise, exercise, as running, cycling, etc., can improve our capacity for obtaining energy from aerobic metabolism. Therefore, the anaerobic contribution is delayed, and this means also a delayed fatigue. So we can increase our performance with less fatigue because of this short run up. But as we live here in Brazil, a tropical country, and also in, in other cases as Tunisia, etc., we should be care about the, uh, the influence of the environment. So when we are performing sports in an open environment, it's very important to consider the effects of the sun, the radiation, with the effect both in the skin temperature and our capacity to a sweet rate. So we can manipulate the duration of the uh, warm-up exercises con when, with consideration of the environmental influences and factors. In this regard, we can, when we have a, a very hot environment, we should take attention to, uh, to increase our food consumption and our electrolyte uh, balance because an excess of street weight can uh, induce an hyperhydration and this means a lowering performance and in a, in a final stage, a uh, problem of health. For example, we should uh, uh, compare or consider differently the influence of the core temperature, okay, or internal temperature and the skin temperature. These are very different phenomena. For example, when manipulated the lab temperature, the increase in the, uh, in the core temperature reduces our capacity for torque production and for voluntary activation. But this is not true for the condition in which only the skin was elevated with application of hot. But both conditions change the torque uh, electrical activity relationship. So the, the MEG activity is reduced when we have or an internal or an external elevated temperature. But 
This means that we should be cared with a sex of internal temperature and not so care about the elevated temperature of our skin. But on the other hand, we have other conditions when we need to maintain passivity because this means uh, not developing fatigue. Okay, and with some statistics like this, for example, with some some kind of of clothes for maintaining our body temperature. And in this experiment, the authors found that the group who used this passive strategy maintained and increased their performance in a repeated sprint ability testing. So this is a very easy strategy, which can be uh, more effective in a, in a situation of cold ambient temperature, okay? At the same time, uh, there are other strategies. This is a very interesting study with other two studies performance subsequently confirming the results in which the authors manipulated the temperature of this apparatus just uh, with a control condition with no apparatus, a hot condition in which, that, in which the apparatus transmitted uh, hot, okay, and a, a condition in which, in which the, the apparatus was transferring cold for the hand. And interestingly, in the cool condition, the uh, subjects in a bench press exercise performed more repetitions in the, in the two, three, and four uh, sets. So this means an increased uh, working capacity only with the cooling of the palm of our hands. However, uh, up to date, we don't know the exact mechanism for this, but we do know that this is an effective strategy and very simple. Another experiment, applicating in the skin and back with coal, uh, induced an increase in the torque per time, just the, the, the rapid production of force, the rate of torque development. Okay, so when we apply in the agonist muscles, we can increase our capacity of exoxid force uh, production. Okay, and this was accompanied with an increase in EMG uh, activity of the target muscles. So this is a very interesting strategy confirming what we said previously about the different effect of the internal, the core temperature effects, and the external and the skin temperature effect. So it seems that cooling or skin is good for performance. In this regard, this recent uh, study, and it has very little literature with these techniques, okay, found that during a squatting exercise performance with one second of concentric, one second eccentric duration, and with five seconds of duration uh, per, per phase of the, of the exercise, interestingly, during the exercise, temperature was lower, okay, and only during the recovery time, the skin temperature was increasing. So we should be care of monitoring the skin temperature in these circumstances, in these kind of setups, because uh, unexpectedly, the skin temperature, contrary probably with the internal temperature, is reduced during the exercise. And interestingly, this lowering temperature was accompanied with a faster increase of temperature in the faster conditions. So fast squatting is better for a faster increase in skin temperature, and the opposite is true for the five seconds condition. And as the professor then said previously, for the static stretching, for the benefits of the static stretching, we need to be adapted and more importantly to perform a short warm-up, aerobic warm-up to benefit for decreased range of motion and to be uh, more uh, a strong and longer muscle length. And as a Professor Ben said also, we can say that these kind of strategies are not uh, very useful when looking for increases in performance, but can be useful for increasing the rate of movement, okay? But on the other hand, this needs time for using this kind of exercise. So as we will see later, maybe this is not a very good option.
Importantly, we have uh, some knowledge when working with a clinic patients about the Wernham and Gina phenomenon. This means that we know that in coronary patients, chest pain and other symptoms of an angina are reduced in a second bout of exercise. So it's important in our context, not only in the clinical setting, but also for performance, that for preserving the cardiovascular health of ex of an athletes and most people, it, it's important to maintain a short aerobic warm up in all the protocols. Because, for example, nowadays in the gym, people are going immediately to the bench press, to the leg press exercise without a warm up and aerobic warm up. But we know for this kind of evidence that a short warm up is important for reducing the peripheral resistance, vascular resistance, and for reducing the, uh, um, the overload of the heart, or heart is a muscle. So it's important to include some kind of short run up for reducing the central uh, pressure, which is most related with problems, with cardiovascular problems in the long term. When talking about post-activation uh, potentiation, we should qualify, and I will not discuss the mechanisms, which are quite uh, difficult to discuss, but the verification in the case of PAP is made with an electrical stimulation. So we have a verification with an electrical stimulus, okay, solution of force. After the conditioning activity, we repeat the same electrical stimulation, and thereafter we can see that the conditioning activity increases uh, the uh, area of the force, the first time cure. Okay? But for performance enhancement, we only perform an exercise with uh, performance uh, purposes. We perform the conditioning activity, and thereafter we expect an increased performance, in this case, a lower time for the sprint. So this is the, the kind of exercise we can verify in the, in the field. So this is Bernard Doctor, um, a famous athlete in the 80s, and this is a very famous uh, video on YouTube in which we can see that uh, he performed a heavy squat, okay, and thereafter he jumped in the stairs of the gym for benefiting from the post-activation performance enhancement. However, if we repeat the literature, he's performing this exercise immediately after the heavy squat, and this is not the best condition because uh, we can uh, suggest that it's very better to wait some minutes for reducing the fatigue. Okay? So this is the classical uh, figure for representing this phenomenon. When we perform a conditioning activity, we develop at the same time the potentiation, but also the fatigue in the muscle. So when the conditioning activity ends, we should wait some time to recover for fatigue, but to maintain some uh, level of potentiation, so there is an optimal window for benefiting from a lower fatigue and a and still present potentiation, okay? And this is important in any case, and it's very difficult to manage, for example, in the case of a competitive setting. And this classical meta-analysis, uh, remember us, some factors that can influence the application of some kind of heavy exercise for benefiting in the, in the next exercise performance, mainly with ballistic exercises. For example, we know that to be trained or to be an athlete is better for maximizing the type, the size of the potentiation, that moderate to high loads are better than low intensity or heavy loads, because heavy loads can use a higher level of fatigue. Okay? We also know that performing multiple sets Two or three sets is better than performing a single set for a performance enhancement. And finally, we know that in most cases, with heavy loads, we need to wait between 7 to 10 minutes for benefiting for this effect. But this is not costly. We have uh, some 
evidence that depending on the training background, the exercise, etc., it can benefit in three, four, and five minutes after the end of the conditioning activity. This is a figure reporting the previous uh, evidence. In the case of the athletes, it's very clear that uh, uh, multiple sets are better for the enhancement of, of, of performance after a conditioning activity. And the same, to be an athlete is better to uh, get the benefits of potentiation earlier in the recovery phase than in the untrained state. Maybe because athletes experience a low level of fatigue after the conditioning activity. So, uh, we should also consider the training background of the athletes. This is a very uh, experimental uh, setting, controlled setting, but for me it's very important because we can see the effects of the same conditioning activity, 16 maximum voluntary, voluntary contractions of the near sensors, and we have here. Uh, some athletes with a predominant type 2 fevers, okay, in, in white and in black, athletes with predominantly white fevers. So interestingly, the fast fever athletes experience early potentiation, but in the, after a few contractions, they are more fatigued and experience a greater level of fatigue than the, than the endurance athletes who experience a little level of potentiation and then they experience a, a, a lower um, reduced performance, but a faster recovery. So interestingly, the endurance athletes with a greater percentage of floating fevers can benefit from, from the from the potentiation during the recovery, contrary to the faster athletes who are still fatigued in the recovery phase. And this is similar with our findings during my uh, testing. In, in the endurance runners experience a higher jump capacity after an exhaustive running test, an incremental running test in the field. And this is probably because of the specificity of the stimuli, of the running stimuli, because it was an endurance stimuli, so they are adapted to the endurance type of exercise. So this Knowledge means that we should consider the specificity of the activity for benefiting for a better uh, potentiation fatigue ratio. And looking for other uh, strategies, we have here an isometric exercise in the warming map with rubbers, and we can see an improved time during the first split of a 1000 rowing time test. But unfortunately, this was not transferred to a better time, a significantly, significantly better time in the total time. Okay, but, but uh, I suppose that the problem with this protocol was that they include plus to the personal individual realm of this exercise. So the, probably they uh, perform a long spring. Sorry, a long uh, warm up exercise, so this means probably more fatigue. So it's important to look for individual responses when including new exercises in our protocols. We, per we presented before uh, some kind of exercise with heavy loads, okay? Typically, the squat with heavy load or with uh, medium to high intensity. But we have strong evidence suggesting that ballistic exercises, for example, plyometrics, are very effective uh, conditioning activities for increasing jam, spring, through, and upper body ballistic, ballistic performances. So this is important because this kind of ballistic exercises can induce a performance in health enhancement deeply than the traditional conditioning activities. So this means we can benefit in uh, two, three minutes after the conditioning activity of the potentiation, contrary to the delayed effect of the heavy loads. In fact, we apply this strategy with some of the best endurance runners here in Brazil, thank you to the collaboration with the nucleus of, uh, of uh, athletic development in Sao Paulo, led by Irene Turco. And we found that the males benefit for some uh, plyometric top jumps with the, uh, the best 
uh, hate, young hate for the best reactive student index, okay? But unfortunately, the image didn't uh, benefit from this uh, strategy. Mainly, we hypothesize that the male uh, athletes have some percentage of past fevers or they are stronger. So maybe, maybe this is the reason why the males benefit from this uh, strategy when performing uh, my thousand meters, okay, a typical aerobic power test, but this was not observed in the female athletes. In another experiment in the lab of Professor Sagato, we found that uh, some uh, drop jumps before a supramaximal cycling network, and we uh, test this twice, so this uh, response is very consistent, okay? We found between 7 and 9% of improvement in the drop jump condition in the supramile, supramaximal cycling exercise. This was uh, uh, made in the, in the two, three minutes after the uh, conditioning activity, and we verified also the post activation modification, that is the twist verification. Okay? So it's at the same time performance enhancement and at the same time post activation potentiation. And importantly, we found that the glycolytic active uh, contribution of energetics for the good performance was related, which related in the case of the job chart condition. So we found not only a mechanical improvement, but also a energetic, a bioenergetic improvement of the uh, physiological responses of the athletes. Apart for improvement of uh, the performance uh, capacity, okay, we can improve our working capacity. This is the case of this study with a heavy two repetitions, maybe I don't remember exactly with 90% or 95%, but in this case it is a maximum intensity bench press, uh, plus the, the, the standard run-up, okay, and in the performance enhancement condition, they found, the authors found, an increase in the number of repetitions in every set, okay, when compared with the control condition. So this means not only improve the power, the muscle power, but only improve our working capacity when we are, we are going to, to train in this specific exercise. However, when we apply the same strategy with a reduced uh, intensity and more sets, okay, and more repetitions, we can find the opposite, no improvement in the working capacity and an increment in the last set of the time under tension, which probably means more fatigue. So we need to adjust our load during the warm up, okay? And uh, for this reason, I advise to use only a few repetitions when performing potentiation strategies to increase the performance and the working capacity. and increase only in the first set of a four set uh, training uh, session, okay? And this increase in performance was also verified with uh, maximum voluntary contraction, isometric contraction, and in the potentiation condition, the subjects also increased the maximal, uh, the peak isometric force, okay? So this means uh, performance enhancement and working capacity enhancement. Other possibilities are the use of the flow restriction. In this experiment, some, uh, um, some uh, single leg squats 
increase with those lower station, increase the jumping capacity 10 to 15 minutes after the collision activity. And following the same rationale, this experiment increased the working capacity with a cube in the arms, okay, in this six exercise during a very complete training session with six different resistance exercises. Okay, however, from a practical point of view, I would say that this is not very practical because the protocol of the cube uh, lasts about 40, 40 uh, minutes. Finally, we can use the RAMAP for monitoring or other. So, for example, in this meta-analysis, the author suggests that using the mean jumping capacity, not the, the highest jump of two or three attempts, but the mean jump height of two or three attempts is good for monitoring uh, fatigue, okay, on a daily basis, and also for monitoring supercompensation in terms of training. So this is a very easy test to be applied, for example, at the end of the warm-up to uh, make some decisions about the, the next steps during the, the main part of the session. And the same rationale can be applied uh, with aerobic exercises. So this work of uh, Professor Dr. Boucher, sorry, uses this kind of so maximal short aerobic run during the warm-up and depending on the responses, we can refer some kind of adaptation or some kind of fatigue, which correlates in this case with the lactate responses. However, uh, we should be careful because sometimes a lower in heart rate in a submaximal intensity means overreaching and not a positive adaptation. So this means that we need to take care to look at different monitoring parameters to take the decision. And uh, for, uh, finally, we should consider that uh, because some evidence with cycle on in soccer warm-ups, it seems that uh, warm-ups longer than 15 minutes are dangerous because they can use more fatigue than activation. So we, this means that we should uh, be careful about this issue and try to use uh, a very short warm-up protocols, including the more important pertinent exercise in our context. And finally, using a, a, an application we develop and validate, I will share with you a, 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 a video with, uh, using a, a short and very simple strategy for monitoring this in the warm-up. So, in this case, Eric, resistance training after five minutes of submaximal running, perform five repetitions in the squat exercise with 30 kilos. So we use a chronometer, okay, with the application in our mobile for five repetitions, include this information in the application, and the mean velocity of the set was about one meter second, okay, and after this First evaluation, uh, Eric performed two sets with 70 kilos, okay, of five, of five repetitions with three minutes of rest between sets. So we are here to the information and start with the set. Go, one, two, three, four, and five, we can look that this set is slower than the previous because of the load, the higher load. And in fact, the mean velocity of the bar was 0 0.75 per second. Okay. So after two sets with a higher load, he rested about five minutes, and then we try to monitor the bar velocity with the lighter bar with only 30 kilos. So we start, and one, two, three, four, five repetitions, and finally, we can easily verify without a, a very complex technology that he proved in 0 0.9 milliseconds the mean velocity of the bar. So this is a very simple strategy to include, for example, 
in a gym setting, okay? So finally, the same take home message is that we should use brief, a brief combination of different exercises. I would suggest to include uh, most all the time, five minutes of a submaximal exercise, okay? Involving uh, uh, a high percentage of, of active muscle, uh, muscle for uh, using the aerobic metabolism and at, at some maximum intensity, followed by a specific uh, exercise. In this case, for example, could be biometrics. Okay? We should use always known exercises because this means uh, lower fatigue and more potentiation because of the muscle memory mechanisms. We should uh, take, uh, pay attention to the timing when we use the different strategies if we need to wait less or more time to benefit from the for the potentiation responses and to maintain the elevated body temperature. And finally, it's important to remember that we can use different exercises in the warm up for verifying the readiness in an objective manner or for monitoring different physiological responses to uh, make decisions about the next part of the session. Okay? So thank you very much for your attention and for the opportunity to be here. So I am open for questions. Thank you, Daniel, for this uh, brilliant presentation. And we learned a lot from it. And here are some questions from the audience. Uh, one is, how would you explain the fact, uh, the fact that athletes needed a shorter time and showed better APA, PAPA compared with non-athletes from the mechanical uh, standpoint? Okay, it's a, a very important question because non-athletes or lower trainers as a people or sedentary people, we would not expect any potential effect. So in the case of very low training or sedentary people, I will avoid potentiation protocols and only include a warming up to elevate the parent. Okay? Just in the case of athletes, it depends on the background. If for example the athlete is a hundred side, a power athlete, a big sport athlete, we should select the specific exercises uh, which improve better, which induce the better performance. So we need to test this during training, for uh, for example, several times to be sure that the, the exercise selected are the best for our specific athlete. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Some other questions? Thank you, Daniel, for this last nice presentation. I have. Uh, Uh, we have another question for, from the audience. The question is, it has been suggested that geometric is better than traditional high intensity. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, uh, there is another question from the audience. The question mm -hmm. is, it has been suggested that geometric is better than traditional high intensity resistance in the size. However, similarly between Second task was considered as a factor that could modulate the effect. What do you think about this point? Okay, very good question. Uh, I would say yeah, that nowadays, with the current evidence, with the available evidence, I would prefer to use ballistic exercises as biometrics to induce potentiation than traditional heavy load exercises. Okay? And in this sense, I understand from the question that. The, 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 we should be aware about the biomechanical specificity of the of the of the exercise, and the current evidence suggests that it's not important to select an exercise 
biomechanically uh, similar with the target exercise. Okay, this is not very important. It's more important the stimuli, the intensity, okay, the nature of the stimuli than the biomechanical similarity. Of oh, that helps. Yes, it is not clear if the public evidence there is a, 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 a review in the European Journal of Electricity and Reproduction Principle about the spinal, the spinal factors involved in association. I do think that these factors are more important for modulating the field fatigue after the conditioning activity than for modulating potentiation effect. So, uh, surely we need uh, more studies to understand better the interest of the neural factors in the situation. Okay. Are you going to question? Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks, Daniel, for uh, your presentation. Uh, this is Anis Thank from uh, SPAX, ICEP SPAX. So, uh, very interesting uh, topic. I, when we look at the ecological validity of the, the, the warm-up, okay, so do you think that all this study uh, has ecological validity in terms that the content of the warm-up is really what we are doing in the field? This is the first, and what is the recommendation for the optimal duration of the warm-up? And you, do you think if we have many components that are, has the potential to potentiate the muscle like dynamic warm-up, like uh, plyometric, like sprint, and like, uh, for example, soccer drills, so we will have additional effect or not. Thank you. Thank you for the question. For the questions, <laughs> you see, we have three or four questions. Thank you very much. So basically, uh, I agree that the most literature provides not very ecological information, okay? So I, as, as suggested, I, I should include all the time three to five minutes of to maximum aerobic exercise, and this is not done in most studies, and this is very important because we know that elevated temperature is important for a power muscle power production. Okay? After this, it's important to select what kind of exercise we need to apply in, the, in your setting, depending on the 20 background depending on the logistic, the, the material we have, uh, for example, biometrics are very useful because we don't need any implement, but if we would like to use a squat, we need the bar, and etc. So this is a very important uh, point to be aware of. And uh, finally, when we are, for example, in the case of the summative attack, it's important to select from general to specific exercises following the, the physiological activation, okay? Avoiding all the time to go further 50 minutes. Maybe 50 minutes is a good time threshold to avoid fatigue. So I would suggest to perform warm up activity between 10 to 50 minutes. No more time like that this. Hope that helps. We have still time? Yes. Huh? Okay, uh, Daniel, another question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. So, when we have, for example, a sport when we have upper and lower muscle, so do we need really to have. You heard me? Daniel? Okay. Uh, okay, so for, for sports when we have upper and lower muscle involved in the practice. So we need uh, uh, stimulus for the upper and conditioning activity for the lower, or one is enough so we can have like general effect. And uh, when we have, uh, does the level of strength matter? Because from my reading, personal reading, I see some paper 
to say that if your athlete is weak, so maybe better to have uh, strength exercise, but if you have uh, athletes with high level of strength, maybe uh, plyometric activity are better. And is there any threshold of strength that we can uh, use to, to, to choose between plyometric drills or uh, strength drills? Thank you. Okay, very good question. And the evidence suggests that it's important for athletes are strong in the exercise we use for compensation. Okay? So we can be strong, sufficiently strong for a biometric and sufficiently strong for a, uh, a, a high resistance exercise. So this means that, as I said, in the take home message, it's important we use always exercises or at least are very familiar shape. Okay? They, they are using in one daily basis. So we can be sure that they are adapted to these exercises so the potentiation is more important than the fatigue when applying this, this, this exercise. And the first question was, sorry? For sports we, uh, that involve upper and lower. Upper. Ah, yes, the upper and the, yes. Very important, uh, thank you very much for this, for this question because as we know that uh, we have a, a global effect of the central temperature, of, of the internal temper temperature. So this is warranted with uh, with uh, general exercise, with anaerobic or maximal exercise. Okay, but considering the potentiation mechanisms suggested in the literature, it's important to perform a specific, from this point of view, a specific exercise. So if I use my arms, it would be important to use also an exercise including the potentiation of the arms. However, remember that the most actions in sport include the lower limbs. Okay? For example, when I, I, I perform a drill in athletics, most of the force uh, came, came from, the, from the lower limbs, from the legs. <laughs> okay? So, uh, we should stimulate both Leads in this case. Hope that helps. Thank you. 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 you. Thank you. you. More is better, or less is better. That means the duration of the warm up should be less. However, I know it's not your yours. Sometimes you must have longer duration of warm up, especially when you deal with cardiac patients, for example. This is why it's sometimes misleading. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the, for the question. I only hear a part of the question, but I, I suppose that the question is about, in some cases, if the duration of the warm-up is not a problem. For example, we all know, uh, we, we as coaches uh, work with endurance athletes, for example, we know that it's very common to see endurance athletes performing 30, 40, one hour, one hour before a competition. Okay, yes, this is true. But the current evidence suggests that a short uh, uh, warm-up mixing different types of exercises could be sufficient. So maybe we need to train to, to work to change the training culture about the duration of the warming up. But as a practitioner, I would recommend in our context with our allies to test. This. So we can compare on different days the effects of combining different exercises with different durations and to see the effect and the feeling of the other, which is also important. Hope that helps. Are you satisfied? Are you satisfied? No, my, my question was about the cardiac patients. Special population. No, no, especially, especially cardiac patients, you need longer durations of the world map. So this one. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for uh, this nice uh, 
presentation. For the Thank you to you for the invitation and for the screen to be recorded for the technical knowledge. The results of the training will be just a question. So I, I don't need this kind of stimulus. Okay, thank you. We have to go to the next presentation. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.